hush money, narcissist, and spiritual abuse in the church. These are three heavy and sad topics on their own, but when they show up in the context of the church, it is straight up nauseating. But these are exactly the things that we're talking about on the podcast today. Hush money, narcissist, and spiritual abuse all exist in the church today, but they shouldn't. They're way too prevalent in churches when they shouldn't exist there at all. So on today's episode, we're going to shine a bright light on hush money, narcissist, and spiritual abuse in the church, but we're also going to discuss exactly what to do when you encounter them. But hey, before we kick off this episode, I want to give you a trigger warning. The conversations on Church Disrupted, they are real, they're authentic, and we're going to deal with serious topics like church hurt, spiritual abuse, and other abuses of all kinds. These are adult conversations that may trigger some of our audience. So hey, if you find yourself triggered or uncomfortable at any time, feel free to skip that part, skip forward, or Skip the episode, we'll always be here for the next one, but we want you to take care of yourself first. So now, if you're ready, let's dive all the way in to episode one of the Church Disrupted Podcast. All right, guys, welcome to episode one of the Church Disrupted podcast. I'm pumped that it's finally here. We're sitting in the room around a table to start this Church Disrupted journey. And uh, guys, we're going to talk about what that's about today, what it's not about. Uh, we have people who are really confused at what we're doing. We're right. right off the bat, we're not trying to tear down the church. We want you to know that we love the church. We love Jesus, um, but we love the bride too much to let some of the things go on that we've seen going on. So we've been dreaming about this yeah. for a while. A lot yeah. more people... Mm-hmm then are just in this room. Um, but today's the day, and I'm really excited that we are finally here. So uh, welcome, Corey Laster, Sean Reese. You're going to be co-hosting with me today. Uh, you're going to see a lot of these guys' faces as you go forward. But we also want you to know you're going to see a lot of other community members, right? Our hosts are actually a host community. We've mm-hmm. got 10 plus voices right now. Y'all are going to be on some episodes other people are going to be on different episodes. I think the only person who's guaranteed to be on every episode right now is me. I apologize. Totally my fault. Wish this looked better. But hey, I got to set this stuff up. So there we are. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Jeff Cochran, and I'll be your host. But today, the conversation is going to be with me, Sean, and Corey. And we're going to be talking about narcissism, spiritual abuse, hush money, But before we get into those things that are in the church, we want to let you know a little bit more about Church Disrupted, right? What is Church Disrupted? What is it not? Uh, First of all, beyond the podcast, we got a community coming. So if you haven't checked out the community, you don't know how to join the community. Maybe you just want people to walk through life with you to help you heal through church hurt, heal from trauma. Um, We want you to know we have a community for that. Check out disrupted.church. You can find out all the information there. Um, But one of the things I want to say about this podcast, you guys both are big Tim Ross fans. We've listened to The Basement for a while. Mm -hmm. He always says vulnerability is their superpower. What I would say for Church Disrupted, our superpower is not vulnerability. We love vulnerability. We want to be there. Honesty is our superpower. Yeah, We're going to be brutally honest. And if you are watching right now, if you're listening, before this first podcast is over, we will probably make you uncomfortable about something. That's just the way it's going to go. We want honesty in these conversations, though. So honesty about the church, about Jesus, about some of the dark sides to the church is what's going to make this thing go. It's what's going to help people in this community actually heal. So, Mm -hmm. hey, let's talk about why are we out here? Why are we doing this right now? Why have we spent this money? Why are we taking time out on a night when we could be with our families? Why are we doing this? Well, our mission with Church Disrupted, it's really simple. We want to take on spiritual abuse and church hurt one conversation at a time. Yes. And you guys, we've had a lot of conversations over the years. What have you seen that is so powerful about conversations around 
church hurt, at times spiritual abuse, when it's not gossip, it's not anything else, but there's something powerful about just having honest conversations. What do you see that makes it so powerful? Well, I think for me, it's been really, really interesting as, you know, our friendship has grown, as my friendship with Sean has grown. One of the things that's really been a key in that relationship has been just how we were able to have like real honest conversations. So behind closed doors, when no one else knew what was happening, I would be able to come to you guys and be like, hey, this is where I'm at. This is what's going on. This is what I'm feeling. This is how I feel. And you guys were able to help me to understand the bizarre ways that I felt, the uncomfortable things that I felt like I was experiencing. And more importantly, you guys were a safe place for me to share those things when I didn't feel like I could have a safe place to share lots of stuff. So this is something that I don't want anyone to think that has been like a new idea. It's not a new idea. We're just going to share it with some people, which is going to be so powerful. And we believe that the same way all those honesty conversations have been able to help us, they'll be able to help a lot more people. And, you know, uh, you always hear it say that uh, misery loves company. Uh, and sometimes people think that's what that is, but uh, I think there's a flip side to that and it's healing loves company. Oh yeah. yeah. And so these conversations are healing and not only that, it brings a sense of community. So, so when you can relate to somebody who's had these hurts, um, and maybe you relate to somebody who's had these hurts because you've gone through them and you've found out how to process it and heal them, you can help them in a different way and it builds a community as well. Yeah. And we've went through different like levels of hurt, different times. Yep. Um, you know, but what it's always been is by having someone else there to talk to one, you can be honest Two, sometimes it feels like you're crazy. Yeah. Like the, the farther you get away from it, because the people, when, when you go through church hurt, the people who hurt you are God's people. Yeah. Right. They are representatives of God. Okay. That's probably more where the quote should have went yeah. representatives of God. Cause we are God's people, yeah. but Pastors are seen as an extension of God a lot of times, and and that's theologically not correct, but it's how we feel. So when you get hurt by a church, the farther you get from that hurt, the more crazy you feel when you bring it up. And it's easy to begin to wonder, did I read that wrong? Is there something wrong with me? And if you hold it down and you hold it and you kind of hide it, you'll never know. But when you start speaking it out loud, you realize, nope, that was wrong every day of the week, no matter what organization we're in, that's not something that looks like Jesus, right? So uh, we want to make sure that we can have those conversations and we want to invite you into the conversation, not to bash anybody, not to gossip. Here's the reason for this conversation. We don't want you to stay church hurt. Okay. It's one thing to be church hurt, you're not responsible for that likely at all, okay? You're not responsible if someone spiritually abused you, but we're responsible if we stay church hurt. We don't want you to stay church hurt. We don't mm-hmm. want you to stay hurt. We want you to walk in healing because, man, on the other side of every hurt that I've went through, God has done something phenomenal. And right. I know there are people who are listening to the podcast right now. They're going, dude, I don't even believe in God anymore. That's okay. Okay. Stay with us. We're not going to try to talk you into believing in God again. Whether you are a a Christian who's been hurt recently or you're a deconstructionist, this is a safe place. We want to help you heal. But for me, my faith has actually grown on the other side of of every hurt. Now, people are already freaking out. What is Church Disrupted? Do you guys just hate the church? Are you trying to tear it down? That's the number one question I've been getting. Are you trying to tear down the bride of Christ. And you know, one of the number one reason why people are asking that it's because the logo, yeah, the logo is freaking people out. By the way, I love this logo. And if you need an incredible logo, like the church disrupted logo, Sean Reese is the guy who did it right there. Sean, give them your website. So if they need some help, you can help them in their business. You can go to sociablepixels.com. Awesome. Sociablepixels.com. Sponsored by. I'm just kidding. It's not sponsored by, but thank you. Sponsored by. You did not pay for this. I did not pay for this. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm here. Yeah, so You're here. <laughs> I appreciate that. So Simon is sponsored by. Um, but no, we love the logo. But if you haven't seen the logo for any reason, the logo is it's just a flat church house that is sliding in two directions. There's two separate pieces. Some people would say it's the church being broken apart and sliding off of itself. Or divided. Right? Or divided. Yeah, right. I've heard a lot about that. Yeah. Um, as if Scripture doesn't say anything good about division, but that's a whole other podcast, right? <laughs> uh, but if you look at it with a different perspective, part of the reason why we wanted to make the logo that way was so that you could look at it with two perspectives. If you look at it in the right way, the church could also be being put back together. Mm-hmm. Right. And, right. And we believe there are certain things that are going to have to be torn down and torn apart in order for the church to start looking like Jesus 
and being put back together. So for some of you, you're going to listen, you're going to watch. I'm going to go ahead and tell you, you're going to think Jeff is trying to tear down the bride of Christ. And you know what? That's okay. That's not my heart. It's not what we're trying to do. But if you feel that way, that's okay. At the end of the day, though, everything we're doing is trying to put the church back together right. in a better place. And can we just, we're going to talk about the church the way people talk about the church to us, yeah. but we got to fix this right off the bat. The church is not a building. Yes. Yes. The church is not an organization. If you call yourself a Christ follower, then you and I are the church. So unless I punched you in the face and told you you're ugly and you have no gifting, I didn't tear down Jesus' bride. Okay. Very true. I tore down a 501c3 in the United States of America that wasn't looking like Jesus. So let's just fix that. Okay. We're not tearing down any of the bride yet. And hopefully not at all. Right. If you leave the wrong type of comment, we may get there. But in Jesus' name, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm trying not to. So, uh, But we want to start, before we jump into really the meat of the first episode, we want to share eight podcast rules with you. These are eight rules that are going to keep us in line and on mission. Okay, right. Remember, that mission to tear down, not the church, but spiritual abuse and church hurt one conversation at a time. We also know if we don't have rules to keep us in line, we'll tear down a lot of things that are not right. the right things. Okay. Yeah. So um, why don't you guys help us walk through this? Uh, Sean, why don't you give them rule number one? Rule number one is honesty is expected. Honesty is expected. Mm -hmm. We already had that conversation before we hit record today. Yep. We did. Right. Honesty is expected every time. If you ever hear us, you challenge us. We're going to try to catch it. Yeah. We're going to try to correct each other. Correct. But if you ever hear us, see us say, hey, things like, can we be honest? Or if I could be honest or let's be honest, um, then you got to call us to the carpet. We're going to try to call each other to the carpet because at this table, these table conversations, honesty is expected. It's the same thing in the church disruptive community. Mm -hmm. Honesty is expected because, again, honesty is is our superpower. Yep. So what's rule number two? Corey, you got that one? Yeah. Uh, rule number two is we don't name names that aren't public record. So we just never want to be bashing or doing anything that may damage the bride. As we said, we our goal is never to be causing any damage. We want to make sure that we are doing and having these conversations without ever injuring anyone else or causing any person who may have been hurt yeah. to be brought to the public if that's not what they're looking for. Yeah. So if John Doe pastor is doing something I disagree with, I'm not going to sit here on the podcast and go, John Doe is a freaking piece of trash. And that guy doesn't need to be in ministry. He's abusive. He doesn't look like, I don't even think he knows Jesus, let alone look like Jesus. That guy needs to lose all of his licenses, all of his ordination. Don't go to his church. That guy sucks. We're not going to say that. Okay. Right. Um, yeah, and I think I'm safe helpful. with John Doe. If there's actually a John Doe out there today, then your parents, they have issues. All Disclaimer, right, we'll if your that. name is John Doe, this is not for you. Yeah, we're not sorry. It's, 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 <laughs> your parents need therapy, and you need to change your name today. Change it from John Doe. Right? Although if my last name was Doe, my son's name would be John. Yeah, because you're, sure. well, you're a jerk, but they'll yeah. find that out uh, as we go through the <laughs> podcast. But yeah, hey, so we're not naming names. We're not going to do that. Um, you may be able at times when we're telling certain stories, we're going to try to keep it where you can't. There are times where you're going to know who we're talking about um, on social media, in the community. Don't try to figure it out. Don't try to name names. We're not going to play that game with you because you know what? Even if all that was right about John, first of all, that's a terrible spirit to say that. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but two, John is the bride of Christ. Yep. And I'm not going to tear down the bride. Now, the church John's at? Maybe, but probably not, because again, that's naming names, right. right? It's a different level. But if we can talk about the systems and the red flags and the things that got John Doe there, well, then you can recognize it in your church. It's not about John Doe anymore. It's about saying, hey, that doesn't look like Jesus, and it's not going to fly. So right. for those of you wondering and listening, watching this first time to go, who's he going to roast? Who's he going to torch? That's not the podcast. So if you want, it, we're going to torch some people, just not by name. All right. So if you want to hear gossip and you want to find out what happened at certain churches, that's not what this podcast is about. I would also say, adding on that, you said that uh, if, if you may know who they're talking about, uh, also be open to the possibility you may have no idea who somebody's talking about. You may think, oh, it's this person, and it's really not. Yeah. So, you know, I think that's going to be a big thing too. Somebody will get on here, get on that. You must be talking about me. Well, I wasn't. So, yeah. you know. However, if you feel like we are talking about you, then there's clearly an issue that should be addressed. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you feel like we're talking about you or your church, one, we're not. 
Okay. Yeah. So get over yourself Two, if the shoe fits, wear it. Okay. Yeah. So here, here's a, this isn't in the rules, but I think we should say this. We're never going to talk about something on this podcast with the record button going and the cameras rolling. We're not talking about anything that we've seen at just one church. Correct. Yes. So we're talking about at minimum your church and someone else's. Okay. Yes. Um, but no, there's, there's a church and some of you'll know this. Some of you won't, we're not getting into it. There's a church that um, I've had to, play some church discipline out with in a very public way. Right. And I'm not talking bad about that church. I would pick up the phone for anybody from that church today. If they would call, mm, right? right. That's, that, that's not the issue. There's going to be some things we say. And if you know what that church is, you're going to go, Oh, Jeff's talking about that church. Um, I, I need you to know I've been in church for decades. Um, I've been hurt in a lot of those churches beyond that. I'm a national church consultant. I've seen a lot of other church hurt. Most of the stories we're talking about is not a church, you know, um, and almost every story is going to be about a different church, right? Or so it's again, multiple churches, multiple you've seen churches. go through the same thing. Yeah. So specific examples yeah. may be a church, but we're only talking about topics we've seen in a lot of churches. So again, mm -hmm. if you're here just to see if we're going to do some sort of, you know, uh, basically rap battle or diss track <laughs> with a specific church or pastor, that's not going to happen. One, cause I can't rap and don't do good diss tracks, but two, cause it's not, it's not Jesus and it's not the mission, right? Our yeah. mission is. It's to do better, to do more. So, uh, what's right. what's the next role? I don't you know? Actually, it goes. On. We've talked about it already. We tear down just toxic structures and systems, not people. We tear down toxic structures, and systems, not people. Okay, so um, there's a lot of systems we're going to talk about. There's a lot of things that allow people to hide things in the darkness, to mistreat people in the name of Jesus. Yeah, we're going to tear that crap down, right? So. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> you know, we talked about it a minute ago, people thinking it's about them. I, you know, I, I had a church not too long ago that they pulled my social media um, because I speak to the church at large a lot, right? right? They pulled my social media and said, well, this was about us and this was about us and this was about us. And I had to sit and say, well, this wasn't about you. You don't even run this system. Yeah. Right. I was talking about this, right? So, you know, for instance, if I say something about growth track and you go to an ARC church that does growth track, I don't inherently hate growth track. I don't inherently hate arc churches. I do have heavy distrust for some of those arc systems. Okay. But just because you use growth track, hear me, it does not mean that I'm talking about your church. Well, I mean, there's a lot of churches that aren't arc or any others that you call it growth track. I mean, when I was in youth ministry it, as a student, they called it growth track. I mean, that was before arc. So that was what, like in the 60s? Yeah, the 1960s, because you're older than me. So well, I had the Methuselah <laughs> looking beard. I've got the really white beard coming in. I got yeah. my haircut today, and it looked like it was snowing. So, I'm, yeah, I'm wondering why you're making fun of me for being old. Cause, it's you know. called deflection, okay? And a lot sure. of pastors do it. We'll talk about it. <laughs> All right, what's the next rule? What number are we on, by We're the on way? Four. We're on four. Rule number four out of eight. What's the next rule? Yeah, so number four is we see conversation, not consensus. Conversation, not consensus. Theologically, do we agree on everything at this table? No. 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 I sat with another uh, podcast host that just signed on yesterday. It was actually two. It was a husband-wife team. And literally, part of the reason why they wanted to sit down with me was to say, hey, the, the wife said, I want you to know I don't theologically agree with a lot of what my husband believes, and I'm not going to respond the same way as him. And I'm like, that's awesome. The three of us agreed about a lot and disagreed about some. Right. We, we're not here for agreement. And honestly, there's going to be some things that are said on this podcast at times that you don't theologically agree with. This is not a theology podcast. We're going to talk about theology stuff, but this is not a theology podcast that says this is right, this is wrong. This is a podcast that says we want to help you dig into your Bible in a way that you can be closer to Jesus. You can know more about Christianity if you are a Christian, but not be manipulated by people who weaponize yeah. Right. Scripture. And there's still stuff that, you know, I know me personally, but I think everybody who's Christian is still figuring out, still working through. Um, I mean, because I think theology is ever evolving and ever changing because as you read more and as the Holy Spirit re reveals more to you, things can change. Yeah. Well, and it's not just theology. We're not yeah. going to agree on everything. There's going to be certain things we do where one person, you may feel like that cross the line. Yeah. Maybe we feel like one another crossed the line. Mm -hmm. You all have the proximity to tell me anytime you feel like I've crossed the line. I'll tell you as well. But as long as it's not black and white, we're going to agree to disagree, right? right? Yeah. Now, hey, if, if you're watching and you're listening, I love you. But if I don't know you and I don't have a personal relationship with you, I'm going to listen to what you have to say, but it's not going to be the same as these guys. 
but even us, we're not going to agree. So if you listen to an episode and you say, man, I, I've loved walking through church disrupted conversations. And then they had one episode and it pissed me off. Okay. That just means it's working. You just right. lost like 10 uh, people to, uh, right there. Turn that episode <laughs> off. Yeah, I just said pissed. Uh, if you, <laughs> you if you're not okay it. with pissed, <laughs> this is not the podcast <laughs> for you. Very true. Right? There's going to be, um, you know, some of our jokes. They're going to they're gonna get out there. Some of our humor is going to be a little irreverent. Not irreverent to God, I don't think, but highly irreverent to church systems. To. Um, but yeah, hey, w- and we're going to say this. We're going to mess up. Yeah. I'm going to mess up. And when we do, we just want you to know, we're going to apologize um, because we are human. So uh, go ahead and get in front of this. You can just play this clip. I'll play this clip when I mess up and you're trying to make it go viral that I hate Jesus and love Satan. Don't clip that. All right. That was not what I'm saying. You just, you just created a perfect <laughs> clip. <laughs> but no, we'll apologize when we're wrong every time. We'll apologize. Yeah. This is the clip that you can share. If you share the other one, we're okay with that. That's actually one of the rules. Uh, rule number five, healing is always the aim. Man, I thought you were going to switch it up and get me to the right rule. I almost yeah, did. I, okay. Healing is always the aim. Um, we will never do a podcast episode where we can't figure out how we're going to help people heal from it. We're going to ask it on the front end. We're also going to ask it on the back end. Did this help people heal? Right. Um, I refuse to gossip. I don't know about you guys. I refuse to gossip out loud in this mic. That's not what yes. this is about. No. No. Yeah. All right. What's the next one? The next one would be, um, we don't give easy Christianese answers. We don't give easy Christianese answers. That's a pet peeve of mine, Christianese. I hate Christianese. Uh, it's it's the worst, dude. So, But you know the answers you get when you go through church or you go through spiritual abuse. You talk, to, you talk to a pastor. You talk to somebody who's hurt you. You say, hey, I don't think this was right. I don't think we're treating people like Jesus. You've heard these Christianese answers. We're yes. going to have a whole podcast talking about these soon, okay? So just stay tuned. We're going to roast some of these. <laughs> um, but I, here's one of my least favorites. You bring a concern to someone, and the first thing they say is, maybe you need to check your heart. Mm, or yeah. don't let a root of bitterness grow up in your life. Okay. Yeah. You know what that's called? That's called gaslighting, kids, and we're not going to do that, right? So we're not going to give... Those answers that you've heard so many times, because we know if you have been through church hurt, those answers are one, they're going to trigger you, but two, yeah. um, they're not helpful, right? They're not helpful. As a matter of fact, a lot of times we're going to give you less answers and we're going to give guiding principles. Correct. Okay. Cause answers are cheap. Yeah. Everybody's got an answer. Guiding principles are going to walk you through more. So if you're tired of the Christianese answers, this is a good podcast for you. If every other word out of your mouth, sentence out of your mouth, phrase out of your mouth is, Christianese and whitewash, then again, you're probably with the crowd that left when I said pissed. Just <laughs> log off. Not your podcast. What's the next rule? Uh, number seven. Uh, we love our haters and detractors. That was the one I was looking for. There you go. Yeah. We love our haters and our detractors. So, hey, here, here's the deal. I'm just going to easy. I'm going to look you right in the eye because this is this important. If you hate everything that I'm doing and you're going to post on social media tonight, like as soon as you listen to this podcast, that's okay. All right. I'm going to answer as many people as I can. At some point, I'm not going to answer everybody. I'm going to answer you. You're not going to bait me into fighting you. You're not going to bait these guys into fighting you. But here's the deal. Keep those comments coming. Keep that haterade coming because the more you comment, the more people see the post, the more people listen to the podcast. Just keep it coming. Um, hey, we also need your help. If you're not a hater and you believe in what we're doing, we know there are going to be trolls. As soon as this first episode airs, they're going right. to give it a zero star review because guys, they hate us. They hate us not because we're bad people, not because we mistreated them. They hate us because what Church Disrupted is doing is shining a light on how they're mistreating people. And if we shine that light bright enough for long enough, it's going to cost some people some money. It's going to cost some people some power. Okay. There are people who are so scared to lose power, so scared to lose money and who are so attached to, you know, how going to a certain church makes them look in the community. Right. They're yeah. going to come and they're going to do that. Okay. I've been, I've had trolls try to tear down my business recently and everything else. So here's what I would ask. If you believe in the mission of church disrupted, you want to see a stand taken against church hurt and spiritual abuse. Give us a positive review, yeah. right? Um, you, you could just be stars. It can be a review. Give us a positive review because we're going to need positive reviews just to cancel out the hater aid that's coming. But Hey, if you're a hater, we love you. And if you're going to have a real conversation, we're always going to talk to you. We're always going to have a real conversation mm-hmm. with you. And if you're going to be a jerk, we won't have a conversation with you, but we do appreciate the engagement um, with our social media and with the podcast. Just keep listening. 
drive those numbers up. Uh, you know, keep putting comments on there, put it in front of other people because, uh, you know, heck, if, if you want to buy a membership to the community just so that you can hear what we're saying and, you know, talk about it, totally cool. I'll take your money and mute you. <laughs> what's, what's the next rule? That sounds healthy. <laughs> it's, yeah, well. Corey, you're up. Uh, number eight is we laugh often because it's good for our soul. Yeah. yeah. Final rule. We've been doing that. If you haven't figured it out by now, um, guys, this could be a really heavy podcast. Yeah. Yes. Like super heavy. We're talking about church hurt. We're talking about spiritual abuse. Like we're talking about spiritual abuse, narcissism and hush money. Episode number one. Okay. This could be a sad, sappy podcast. This could be one that like yeah. depresses people. So we're not going to do that. We're going to crack jokes. We're going to laugh about it. Yep. Um, but part of the reason is just cause that's who we are. The other part of the reason is when you can laugh about it, when you can laugh about the experience, when you can laugh even about some really abusive people, it is not okay what they're doing. Hear me. It is yeah. not okay what they're doing, but when you can laugh at them, you can laugh about the situation. You disarm the power of the narcissist in your life. True. Okay. So part of the reason why we laugh, scripture says it's medicine to the soul. It's like good yeah. medicine, right? Mm. But also we laugh because it takes away the power of those who wish to control us. Right. Um, again, because we're not walking in church hurt. We're walking in healing one day at a time and we want to bring you with us. So um, now if you don't like this and the laughing is not good because you want to stay sad and you want to stay hurt and you want to stay traumatized, this isn't the right podcast for you. We're going to walk with you as slow as you need us to walk with you. There's no speed that, that is one size fits all for people in healing. There's, there's no speed or expectation on how fast you deal with your trauma. Right. The only yeah. expectation is that you are dealing with mm -hmm. your trauma. We want to help, right? You don't have to get where we're at today, but we do want you moving forward. So we've talked about the podcast rules that are going to keep us in mission. They're going to keep it on mission. And in line. I can't talk today, but on I'm, and in. Yes. On and in. Yeah. Um, but here's the deal. All those in a nutshell, they really say this. We're confronting issues, not people. Yeah. We're talking about issues. We're talking about problems. We're talking about things that need to be fixed. Um, and again, we're not going to talk about an issue if we've only seen it in one church. But one of the questions you may be asking right now is, hey, why you guys? Why now? Right. Two really good questions. Right. I asked that question for a long time before I started dropping thousands of dollars on this podcast. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, this is something we believe in. We would not be doing it. Okay. If I was doing this to make money, then this is a terrible business venture because right. well, so far it has only cost me money. Like we just want to get to where it's not costing us money. Right. That's, that's yeah. the first step. Um, but guys, we're not doing this to make money. We're not doing it because it's easy. I've had to check my spirit a lot and say, why do I need to do this before I said yes? Yeah. Um, so I'll tell you when, when, why us, why me, why the people that I've invited to the podcast community, I'll answer for me, but I want you guys to answer for some of the podcast hosts. But we asked the question, or I asked the question myself, if not me, who? And if not now, when? Yeah. And I couldn't come up with another who. I could come up with a lot of people who would join me. Right. But I couldn't come up with another who that would feel confident enough to step up and stand against some of these things in the church. Because you guys feel it. If you've been through church hurt, you feel this. There are going to be people coming after me, and I know that. Yeah. And I knew there's not a lot of people who could count the cost. Um, so, yeah, yeah, I couldn't answer another who. And if not now, when? I didn't know how long it was going to take, but here's what I knew. If it took very much longer, then that just means there's a whole lot more people who are getting hurt, a whole lot more people who are getting traumatized, a whole lot more people who have spiritual PTSD, and worst of all, a ton more people who are leaving the church and thinking about leaving the faith because the people who represented Jesus to them looked more like hell than heaven. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. What about you guys? Well, for me, um, <clears throat> having gone through several different types of church hurts and um, different types of people, I mean, I've worked in the church, uh, volunteered in the church, whatever. Um, I inherently have a deep sense of justice. And so when I see somebody who is being treated, I, if I'm treated that way, I can, I can deal. No big deal. It's it's. I mean, it hurts, and I and I deal with my own way, but it's not a big deal. But when I see other people being treated that way, mistreated and hurt, um, or um, even walking away from faith entirely because of something that somebody did, and you know, 
I'm not going to say, you know, you should walk from away from your faith. You have that old Christianese answer, like, well, God didn't hurt you, people did. Um, but, you know, a lot of times... Or like, the really unhelpful one, oh, that person walked away from their faith? They must not have been a Christian from the, yes. the from the beginning. If, yeah, if getting that. their feelings hurt can make them walk away from the faith, they must not have been a Christian. The only people yeah. who say that are people who have never been through any sort of real trauma, because nobody walks away from a church just because they got their feelings hurt, or at least... They may walk away from the church. So they're not going to walk away from the faith. Right, There's real right. trauma there when people walk away from the faith. I, I would say that the uh, that statement is true for a, an extreme minority of people. That maybe they weren't real Christians if their feelings got hurt. John Doe, John Doe specifically. John Doe. That guy's yeah. a jerk. <laughs> uh, but yeah, when I see people that, and if there's something I can do, uh, then I want to do it. And um, I believe in the church, just to be clear. You know, I, I mentioned this to somebody who asked me something about this the other day. I said, look, I believe in the church, and I believe the church can be great. Um, the church as an organization, not uh, necessarily just the Bride of Christ. Well, but you were at a church on Sunday. Yeah. Yeah. You, Corey, you were at a church on Sunday. Yeah. I was at a church on Sunday. Heck, we're visiting churches right now because we have no clue where we're going. We're there every Sunday. We're yep. tithing. We're serving. We're doing all of these things. We don't hate the church. No. We hate people who play church and make Jesus look bad. Yeah. We hate people who jump in the sheep pen and say, I'm here to take care of the sheep, when really, I'm just going to, man, I'm going to break their legs. I'm going to kick them out of the pen when they look at me funny, yeah. or I'm a wolf in sheep's clothing. That's a little Christianese, but dang, man, there are some wolves in there. There are also some people who forgot they were once just sheep who needed shepherding. Right. They forgot they were called the shepherd, and they twist scriptures to say things like, you know, talk about shepherding. They twist scriptures to say things like, well, a good shepherd will protect his sheep, even if that means breaking their legs. If you've listened to a certain documentary, you've heard that one. Yeah. Um, if you're a pastor that tells people it is okay for you to break their the sheep's legs, it's okay for you to discipline them hard in that level of correction because you're doing it in the name of Jesus, then we need to talk and you need to let me break your leg for discipline for twisting that scripture. So, you know, yeah. I, I, I don't believe that, but if you believe that, I will break your leg for you to help you come around. He's to speaking help you figuratively for anybody who's wanting to... It kind of does. <laughs> Most <laughs> likely. Most likely. Yeah. Yeah. Most likely. There, there are some people whose legs I would like to break, not because I don't love them, but because how badly they damage people, dude. Yeah. Right. God. So when I see stuff like that, that's what that's what makes me want to come on here because I believe that it can be great, uh, and that it can be a catalyst for change and help people, um, and change people's lives uh, when done correctly and when these systems aren't toxic. Systems aren't in place. Yeah, and systems are always going to go toxic. Mm -hmm. Right. But that's not a big deal if people call it out. Right. If the church learns to call our own fouls, that's not a big deal. It's a big deal when we let toxic systems grow because then once it starts affecting somebody's power, dude, that that's a whole different deal. That's a whole different deal entirely. Yeah, definitely. My biggest, uh, one of my biggest pet peeves is when they say, you know, hurt, hurt people, hurt people. It, it's kind of like, well, you know, they're hurting too. So it's fine if they do that. It, it's not. Yeah. 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 Well, Hurt people hurt people. That's an excuse in one way. Mm -hmm. And the other way, it's the reason why we got to help people heal. Yeah, it's right. the reason why we're doing this podcast yeah. because hurt people do hurt people. Sure. But hurt people don't have to hurt people because if you get healed, you can actually help other people heal. You're right. going to propagate and you're going to keep kind of running in a loop what you've experienced and yeah. who you are. Yeah. So that's why we're standing up to church hurt, man. We're doing this because the more people we can help heal, the more healing we can bring. What? And yeah. instead of church hurt making people leave the faith altogether, it could actually be a strengthening moment in their faith. And if you're a hurt person hurting people, then you're probably not – leadership's probably not the, the in the cards for you at the moment until you find that healing. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's not, not forever. Just like, hey, if you know, like, hey, I'm in a place where I'm, I'm just hurting people because yeah. I'm hurting really badly, then you need to maybe take a step back. Yeah. And, you know, it doesn't find that, mean you're know, a bad person. No, not it at doesn't all. doesn't mean you can't be in leadership again. It means mm -hmm. you need to be in leadership now. You want to know what would fix a lot of that? What? So you think about this. Pastors, and we're going to talk about this on a future podcast episode, but pastors and therapists, social workers, those, th those three professions, they tend to be really broken people with really bad past. Why? They're the helping professions mm -hmm. yeah. and people are drawn to helping professions. I'm not, I'm not throwing shade if you're in one of those professions. Okay. Um, I'm a pastor. I'm not a, not a pastor for my day job, but I am a pastor ordained. It was my day job for a long time. My wife's a therapist. I'm talking about us, right? So we're not throwing shade at you if that's you, 
but those helping professions, there's a lot of data out there. The people who are drawn to helping professions are usually the people who have been most hurt. Why? Because when you experience healing, you want to help other people heal. Mm -hmm. The problem is a lot of people in helping professions have only experienced partial healing, yeah. which means you're helping people heal, but the part that is still hurt, you're hurting people the same way. And I did the same thing because I did ministry with you guys for a really long time, and right. I was 90% healthy and probably 10% that I hadn't dealt with. Yeah, I ended up going to a therapist because I said, I remember telling my boss at the time when he said, why do you want to go to a therapist? I said, I want to go to a therapist because there's something that is holding me back and I don't know what it is, but yeah. I feel like there's another gear in me. Well, it didn't take long talking to that therapist. I remembered stuff from my childhood that I didn't even know. First yeah. of all, ended up getting diagnosed with PTSD from emotional abuse and verbal abuse when I was a kid and some physical abuse. Right. And because of that, um, man, I was able to walk into a new level of healing. What that also means is I had done over a decade of ministry mm. with an active case of post-traumatic stress syndrome disorder, whatever, right, that I hadn't dealt with. So there are people that I hurt because I hadn't dealt with my hurt. So if you're a pastor wow. listening to this, and pastors, we love you. The majority of the pastors who are listening to this podcast hear me. All this is going to do is help you to help people who have dealt with church hurt. When they come to your church, you're going to help restore them. Um, it's going to help you to know ways that you might hurt people on accident. You're going to be a better pastor when you listen to this podcast, right? We love you. We want you to succeed. But I want to tell you this. If you're a pastor and you're not in therapy, please get in therapy. If you can't afford therapy, DM me, talk to me. We're going to try to figure something out. Okay. One day we hope to have a nonprofit that covers that for pastors, but we don't yet. Okay. I can't promise you anything. This is not a promise, but if you will call me, I will help talk to you, help you find ways, uh, talk about counselors with sliding scales, whatever it is. If you are a pastor, can I beg you to be in therapy? Doesn't mean anything bad about you. It means that you are taking the initiative to make sure that you're whole and healed so that you can bring health and you can bring healing to other people. So, uh, man, pastors, don't don't let anybody talk you out of going to therapy. Going to therapy is one of the best things I've ever done in my life. Yeah, um, yeah. And I really, man, I wish I could go more today. So, pastors, we we love you, and we want you to walk in healing, too. Yep. All right, Corey, you're up. Why are you doing this? So, um, for me, it's been really, really you revelation. So long, by the way. You're welcome. <laughs> it's been uh, really revelational over the years. Um like 10 plus years of doing ministry and experiencing a calling to help hurting people. Uh, and it's just been really revelational of how many people are hurting, how many people need help and don't know where to find the help. It's really been painful watching as people have walked away from their faith and don't know how to get back there. Yeah. And it's been really, really motivating to see people who I know need help, and they know they need help, but they don't know what to do with that. Yeah. So my personal mission has been for a while to help those who are the lost sheep, the forgotten people. Yeah. And that's something that, you know, I've been able to develop and hone in on. But over the years, that's really been something that I've been focused on is helping those people who need that help. And Church Disrupt is going to be a great catalyst for that. Yeah. It'll be a great place for people who've experienced hurt, who may be angry who may harbor some resentment towards God, people and churches. And we want to help them get, get, get healthier. So yeah. that's why I'm here. I want to make sure that I'm able to share my story to help build a greater story. Yeah. Yeah. And, and um, shout out to Corey. I, I've never told him this, but I've seen him in as a volunteer in student ministry that Jeff has too. And he's walked through stuff with students that's absolutely incredible the way he's been there for them. Um, he's been there for students more than a lot of youth pastors I've ever known. And their parents. And their parents. Like, let's just yeah. say that you've been there for parents that you didn't have to be there for. Mm -hmm. So this, he, he puts legs to what he's talking about. Like, he, he really does it. So, yeah, he puts legs to it. I, I would say he puts his money where his mouth is. Yeah. He spiritually gambles. Yeah, we do. We, 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 we talked, you know, we've, we've said the word pissed. We've, you know, we've yelled, we've talked about gambling. Um, so hopefully the conservative crowd, the hyper conservative crowd, they're gone. They're gone at this point. Right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, so my background specifically, guys, one of the things I thought about too was God, I believe has specifically put me in this place to be able to do this right now. Right. My background is, is very unique. You know, um, I grew up with that abuse. 
Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I've been, uh, I was a pastor actively as my full-time job for over 17 years. I was a pastor in small churches and mega churches. So I've been all around the gambit, um, been a a part of a lot of different denominations and non-denominational stuff. I'm a national church consultant, been doing that for like seven years now, traveling the country, working with all types of denominations, all types of cultures for uh, building systems that work and helping fix systems that don't, right? And there have been a lot of times where I've had to talk to pastors and say, hey, what you're doing is not okay. There's also been times where I've been scared to say it because I was scared it was going to affect my paycheck. Right. But I've yeah. been around all of it, right? We talked about having the PTSD. I've felt abused and discarded by the church, but more than anything, more than anything, I've been the abuser at times. Before I got my stuff together, I've been the abuser. And, and part of this journey, part of getting to this point and getting to episode one, I've had to call people, DM people, reach out to people, who had me blocked on social media, had not talked to me in years to apologize. And you want to know what's crazy? I've not had a single person who said, I refuse to forgive you. Most people have come right back into my life. And the whole thing was just, Hey, it was never that you hurt us because people make mistakes. Pastors, you're going to make mistakes. What people want from you more than anything is simply to say, you're sorry to own up to it when you make the mistake. Yeah. But I believe that God's put me in that place where I can say I've been abused spiritually, physically, emotionally, like outside the church, inside the church. I've worked on these systems. I've been a part of some of this abuse, been totally discarded at times. So I get it. Right. I get it. And we just want to say this. There's a couple of things I, I want you to know. One, I am so, so sorry for your hurt. I'm sorry you're hurting I'm sorry for the trauma you've went through. I'm sorry you had to deal with that. I'm sorry that mis- people mistreated you. And you may never hear it from the pastor that hurt you. Okay. But can I just stand in the gap for them for just a moment? Can I stand in their place as a pastor? As this is one of the only times it's good to be like a white middle aged man because that represents a lot of pastors. Okay. <laughs> sorry. Can I stand as a pastor and say on their behalf, I am so sorry? I'm so sorry. I'm sorry that you had to deal with that. I'm sorry you were hurt. I'm sorry that I hurt you. I'm sorry that the church hurt you. I also want you to know you're not crazy. You're not crazy. And this is not your fault. Yeah. You're not crazy. It's not your fault. People have likely gaslit you into believing that you're crazy. And this is your fault. Abuse of any kind is never your fault. It's the same thing as spiritual abuse. So I am so sorry. This is not your fault. You're not crazy. And know this, that was not Jesus. The hurt you went through, the hurt maybe you're going through right now, what these people have done to you in the name of Jesus, it was not Jesus. He is not okay with it. And please don't let the hurt someone else put on you change the way you see Jesus because Jesus was right there. There were hurt. And I'll say this, as hurt as I've been by the church, man, when, when there have been times where we've lost jobs at the church. Mm. Yet again, the bride is not the organization. The church stepped up. When we refused to sign a non-disparagement agreement, when my spouse got fired and we didn't get the severance because of it, the church, the people of God, they stepped up and gave us more than the severance. We were trying to tell people at one point, we don't need money. We're okay. And they would say, no, God told me to send this your way. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and then, of course, something would come up, and I would be like, oh, God sent it our way before we needed it, right? right. Yeah. That's the church. So we want you to know that wasn't Jesus. Um, but again, and if nobody ever tells you, I am so sorry. Hey, a couple of more things, and we're going to jump into the really meat and potatoes of this one today, um, which, by the way, we're like 42 minutes in. So if people haven't realized, this is not a short-form podcast. Right. Um, feel free to pause this on a couple of commutes. Um, maybe more than one workout, you know, um, but we're, a lot of these are going to be probably between, um, you know, an hour and a half and two hours, maybe a little longer, sometimes maybe a little less. We don't have a script. I've got a few notes because this is the first episode, right? Um, we don't have a script though. Church disrupted has transcripts. We just have a conversation and then we will give you the transcript when we're done. There, there's no script, right? Our preparation has not been, it's not that we didn't prepare, We said this is what we're talking about, but there wasn't a, hey, this is your time to talk, Corey, and this is your time to talk, Sean, and we have to be done at this time. And it's just not the way that we roll. But hey, 
we're going to recognize, we're going to recognize if I can talk, we're going to recognize victims. Yeah. We're going to recognize victimization because that's something the church has been very poor at. Um, when we went through our latest bout of church hurt, um, there was a lot of spiritual abuse. It was more than church hurt. Okay. It's been over years, but every time that I've talked about it, there have been well-meaning Christians who have given the Christianese answer of Jeff, you need to get over your victim mindset. That's just Satan getting you stuck in a victim mindset. No, John, it's not Satan. It's a jackass who called themselves by the name of Jesus and actually mistreated people. Right. Okay. Yeah. That's not Satan. And it's not, there's nothing wrong with being a victim. People play that card. Like don't, don't have a victim's mindset. Nobody who knows me has ever actually accused me of having a victim's mindset. Right. Right. Yeah. That, that, that's not who I am. I'm solutions oriented. I'm all those sort of things, but it's really easy to say that to shut a victim up. Well, that's not a victim mindset, what you're talking about. No, it's not. A victim mindset is every time something happens, you're the victim. Like, oh, well, yeah, yeah, maybe I spent my entire paycheck on, you know, whatever. But, you know, it's not my fault that I don't have rent money. Yeah. It, no, that's not a, that, that's a victim mindset. When something actually happens to you and you're hurting and you're going through it, that's yeah. being a victim. Well, a victim mindset, we wouldn't have started this podcast. Yeah, and if we true. did, it would only be a, woe is me. I've been through so much hurt. Yeah. You guys should give me money because the hurt I've been through, right? That's not, that's not what this is. Yeah. Instead, this is a, hey, it's okay to hurt, but we want to walk you through healing. I've been through enough crap that I'm going to do something about it. Right. I'm going to do something about it, which is not a victim mindset. But I know a lot of you, you're, you're watching, you're listening, you've heard that. Hey, you need to get over that victim mindset. At Church Disrupted, we're not going to do that. We're going to recognize, recognize victims. You're going to recognize victimization. Um, but here's the other deal. We're also going to help you heal. We want to help you overcome it. And we want to help you be able to move forward. Notice what I just said. We want to help you be able to move forward, not move on. Moving on is bogus. Yeah. People say, hey, just move on. Just get over it. No, 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 no. We want to help you move forward. This trauma, if you've experienced heavy spiritual abuse, it may be with you for the rest of your life. Right. For others, it may be a couple of years and you can move on. But regardless of whether it goes away, you can always move forward. Mm -hmm. Moving on gives the implication that we left it behind. And for me, I know there's certain things that have happened I can never leave behind. Right. But I can forgive, right? And I can move forward and I can turn it into something better. So we want to help you move forward and not stay in that state of being a victim. So that's something we're going to do. But um, I'll talk about this, uh, you know, later in another episode, but, um, I had a friend when we were getting ready, not at this table, I was trying to decide if this podcast was something I needed to do. I right. felt like God was calling me to do it, but I was scared. And I had two friends who came to see us. They live in Virginia. Um, they came out of their way to see us. And one of the things that the wife said was, we felt like we were called here today to confirm something in you. And when I started talking about this podcast, she said, that's it. You're supposed to do it. I had a journal she showed me where she had been praying about a podcast. But she said this phrase, it stuck with me. And it's really the reason behind Church Disrupted. She said, I believe that God is calling you to extend your table, Jeff. And she pointed at our kitchen table at the time. And she said, you have helped. You and Candace have helped hundreds of people walk through church hurt and spiritual abuse and trauma and stay in ministry and reconstruct their faith and love yeah. Jesus. She said, you helped us do the same thing. And I can't get it out of my head and heart that God is calling you to extend your table. So that's what Church Disrupted is. Mm -hmm. It's not just my table. We're extending the kitchen table to you. This is a place for you to pull up to be able to jump in community, share your story, to hear other people's stories, to find out ways to heal. We're not going to sugarcoat it. This is an extension of those kitchen table conversations that we've been having for a long time. Right. Right. And I love this. This is, um, this is one of those verses that gets weaponized a lot. It got weaponized against me recently, but it's one of those where people only talk about one part of the verse and not the next one. Right. So first Timothy five, 19 through 20. All right, 1 Timothy 5, 19 says, Do not listen to an accusation against an elder unless it's confirmed by two or three witnesses. Okay, that one is, hey, don't talk about the abuse. Don't talk about someone lying. Don't talk about someone mishandling finances. Don't talk about that affair, right? Because if you don't have witnesses, you can't bring it. Right. But yeah. here's the other thing. 
Sometimes we can have witnesses, by the way, to patterns of behavior and not specific sins. If there are witnesses to patterns, there's a problem. But here's what Paul said next to Timothy in uh, 1 Timothy 5, 20. Those who sin should be reprimanded in front of the whole church because this will serve as a strong warning to others. So let this podcast be a strong public warning. If you are mistreating people in the name of Jesus, and when you get called on it, instead of apologizing or learning, you try to hide it under the rug and you try to shut people up and you try to do anything you can so that you can keep power and keep mistreating people. If that is you, this is public warning. We are going to shine a light all over that bull crap. You will not be able to keep doing it, right? This is your warning in Jesus' name. If you sin, we will shine a light on it, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And I think that's that's where I want to go. Hey, church leader, you think about doing something inappropriate and you don't go there because you know you're going to get called out. I also, I want us to de-weaponize scripture for the sake of abuse. And I want us to re-weaponize scripture for the sake of healing, for the sake of moving forward, and for the sake of actually having kingdom conversations. There are people in pastoral roles who use scripture to weaponize it against people and control them more than anything. We want to help you re-weaponize scripture for yourself. And that's, hey, how can I get in scripture and let the Holy Spirit speak to me? It is time for the church to start calling its own fouls. So let's talk about it today. Here's the, the big kind of elephant in the room. With all the stuff that we're talking about, we're talking about a few big heavy hitters. We're going to talk about narcissism. We're going to talk about spiritual abuse. We're going to talk about hush money. How weird does that that sound and feel to talk about hush money? All those church. things that you're besides spiritual abuse. If you just take out the word spiritual and just call it abuse, uh, you're talking it sounds about like, like the mob. Sounds like the mob, corporate America. You know, like these big time companies that gone under. You know, you think in the yep. in the news, uh, Jeffrey like Jeffrey Epstein or something like that. You know, that's that's what you think of when you think of all that. Not the church. Yep. So hush money, narcissist, spiritual abuse, and uh, here's the other part we're talking about. Why now is the time to do something about it. Right. Why we've got to stop ignoring it and overlooking it and saying it'll come out one day. Guys, we got to do something about it. If the church will start calling our own fouls, less people will leave the church because they'll realize, no, no, the church calls out abusers like everybody else. The problem is church scandals happen when someone else calls our fouls. Yeah. And people find out, like the Southern Baptist Convention, all right, on public record, that they were hiding for years and decades, sexual abuse. Mm. That was what caused people to leave, you know, the faith or to leave Southern Baptist churches. It wasn't the fact that people in their churches abused. That is going to happen, right? The earlier we call our fouls, the better. But let's talk about this. So hush money, narcissism, spiritual abuse. We need to start with some kind of common definitions, because if we don't, We overuse labels like narcissism for real. Like we want to call everybody's not a narcissist. Well, that's a different podcast. Everybody is, but you are too. So everybody's not a diagnosable (laughs) narcissist. Narcissism is a spectrum, right? Um, Spiritual abuse. Some people are like, I was spiritually abused because someone asked me to tithe. You weren't spiritually abused. You just had a conversation about tithing you didn't agree with, right? Right. I was spiritually abused because they asked me to serve two days in a row. You weren't spiritually abused. If they asked you to serve two days in a row, every weekend for months, maybe, right? But a lot of people are scared of spiritual abuse because they think, oh, that's snowflake syndrome. That's just people going, oh, I got my feelings hurt. I'm calling it spiritual abuse. So we're going to define all of these. So we're starting with a good definition. Then we're going to talk about, hey, where do they show up in the church? Why do they show up there? What can we do about it? How can we heal? Um, And how can we stop it from happening in the future? So let's talk about hush money. This is a really simple definition. I hate the fact that we have to talk about hush money. This is so stupid. It's cringy. Yes. It is cringy. Yeah. Yet I've got the NDAs, man. Uh, hey. I, you know, I, I, okay. I want to say raise your hand if you've signed an NDA, but that wouldn't be good with podcast yeah. hosts because there's a lot of NDAs. Know. Is, uh, is it illegal to, to, to I, say I you signed one? It's not illegal for me. I didn't sign one. <laughs> All right, it's illegal for people who I didn't sign one. All right, so it's, it's a whole other podcast. We're going to talk about the NDAs. Boy, that's going to be a cringy episode. Um, you're going to want to listen because it's real, folks. It's yeah, real. Yeah. But hey, here's hush money. Hush money is money paid to a person to keep them quiet about something that belongs in the light. Mm. 
every time there is money and it doesn't, nobody's going to call it hush money. They're going to call it a severance. They're going to call it a gift for your family, especially when it's volunteer. How, how about a love offering? Oh my gosh. <laughs> and some oh. people are freaking out because they just heard that and they're like, Jeff, do volunteers really get asked to sign NDAs? Yes. yes. Volunteers get asked to sign NDAs. We want to take care of your family. We want to love on you. We want to support you in this difficult time we caused in your life. <laughs> right? Um, so we give you this money. Here's the deal, though. That money, anytime it's given with the, the stipulation of your silence, it's because someone's trying to hide something that Jesus wants in the light. Yep. Yeah. Right. If they love you and want to support your family, that's called a gift. And you mm -hmm. don't have to sign anything to receive a gift unless it's like they sent it UPS. And then maybe you need to sign it. But most of the time, UPS guys sign it for you they, anyway. They do, so really, it's you don't need to sign that. But what do they do? They grab people. Hush money is used to keep them quiet. And it's yes. usually when people really need money as well. So the church basically buys our silence. That's hush money. Okay. We're not talking about like some small under the table payment. We're talking about, I know of multiple payments by churches, some to volunteers, some to staff that were in the six digit range. Mm -hmm. That's tithe money in the six digit range. Yeah. Those are big hundred plus thousand dollar checks because you know something we don't want you to talk about. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I have, you know, I've also seen them really small, so they're not all that big, but that's, that's hush money, right? Narcissism. Let's, let's talk about this. I'm going to give you the, the clinical definition of NPD, narcissistic personality disorder. Right. Only like 1% of people are diagnosed with this. Cause again, it's a spectrum, but you're going to hear some of these things from narcissism, but then I'm going to give you the nine traits of a narcissist and it, and it comes in an acrostic that is going to blow your mind and make you giggle like a small child. Okay. <laughs> anyway, here, here's the boring definition. Narcissism is characterized by a grandiose sense of self-importance, a lack of empathy for others, a need for excessive admiration, and the belief that one is unique and deserving special treatment. Now we all know people who fit those categories, right? Right. Okay. Yeah. That doesn't mean that they're diagnosable narcissist, but we're all a little narcissistic. We're all on that narcissistic spectrum. So how narcissistic are you is the question. Right. So when you're looking at like church leaders, you're looking at uh, business leaders, political leaders, but in our case, specifically church leaders, and you want to know, is that church, leaser, that church leader narcissistic? You want to look for those things. Do they have that grandiose sense of self-importance, lack of empathy, excessive admiration, on and on and on. Now, here's the hard part. That is really easy to hide when you are charismatic and you're a pastor. You're rarely going to find a pastor that you say they don't have empathy. But I know a lot of pastors, when you get to know them really close behind the scenes, they don't have a lick of empathy. But it looks like they have empathy because they're so good at, at um, you know, Sometimes you'd say leading people, pastoring people, but I think it's really more of just the manipulation of using the charisma, right? But they look like they have it together. That's the clinical definition. Let me give you, though, the nine traits, the nine traits of a narcissist. And these spell out the acrostic, special me. Special, special me, me right? <laughs> and that's how I remember it when I'm looking. These are nine traits. If someone has... A, a good handful of these, they're fairly narcissistic, right? right. Special me. And I'm actually thinking of, man, I'm thinking of, uh, of pastors who have like, they've just talked about how special they want to be. And they feel you know, called the special things and they just have this desire to be special. So when I see that, uh, it, it reminds me sometimes of those pastors, but it's also just, man, it sounds so weird. Special me. Yeah. So remember special me. Honestly, I just, out I just thought narcissistic of someone Elmo. Else. Elmo, special, special me. me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so here's the acrostic, the nine traits of a narcissist. Uh, the S in special me is for sense of self-importance, right? Now, again, when we talk about having that grandiose sense of self-importance, that sounds bad. But when you just talk about self-importance, in, in church settings, that comes across as a calling that is extra special in their yeah. life. Mm -hmm. Now, look, do you have a calling in your life? Yes. Do I have a calling on my life? Yeah. Yes. There are pastors who really believe the calling on their life is way more special than everybody else's. Yeah. Right. It's bigger. It's weightier. Right. And it's going to come across sounding kind of holy like that. But that's where this is going to come from. That sense of self-importance. How do you guys see the sense of self-importance show up 
like in the church. Can you think of any? Well, kind of like what you said, <clears throat> that their their calling is like, well, not just anybody could do this. Only I can do this. I'm special. I've had this amount of training. Oh, I've, my gosh. I, where I, am I? Who here's am I? One, here's one that will make it nauseous. <laughs> not everybody can run with us. Because Ooh, we're I, so I, driven. I heard that we're on a so podcast somewhere. <sighs> Uh, yeah, that's a whole thing. It but just I'm makes not, me nauseous. I've makes not just heard it on a podcast. I've actually heard it in real life. I've actually heard people say that. I've heard it a um, lot. Y- yeah. yeah, more than more than you'd think would so, be. I've heard it in churches I've worked at, but I hear it all the time in consulting work. Yeah. Well, you know, it's hard for us to hire people. We're really fast paced. We're really driven. Not everybody can run with us. And after about the hundredth time of hearing that. Every church is not specially driven. Every church is not a unique butterfly. If people can't run with you, let let me just challenge you, Pastor, if you're listening to this. Jesus didn't call you to be fast-paced and driven. Mm. He called you to feed and care for the sheep. So if you're running faster than the sheep, you've gotten confused about what you're actually supposed to be doing. Maybe you should slow down, backtrack, and get in the freaking sheep pen. Yeah. Just a little, little. I don't side. think sheep are that fast either, are they? They're not. They're not that smart either. But that's a whole separate thing. So anyway, <laughs> special me. The S is a sense of self importance. P in special me. I laugh every time I say it. Preoccupation with power, beauty, or success. Mm-hmm. So for some churches, most of us were never going to see a pastor that comes out and says, "You know what? I really, I would like some more power." I wish I had. They'll, they'll say, if they're going to say anything like this, they'll at least whitewash it to say, we want to steward well the influence that God has given us. That sounds so holy. Yeah, influence is just a special word for power, though. But here's how you'll, you'll hear it. Not just the preoccupation with power, the preoccupation with beauty. It's how we look, how we're perceived. We don't want anybody saying anything on social media that may make us be perceived bad. We don't want anything on the cameras that may make us perceived bad. We don't want to post anything online on a worship service without pitch correction because God forbid something's wrong with it. It would make us look bad. But let's go even farther. The whole preachers and sneakers movement. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Look, I know preachers, plenty of them, that they've got to get a fresh lineup or a fresh cut before every time they speak. Every time they do a big event, they have to get a fresh cut and a fresh set of clothes for that event because they're so concerned and consumed with how they look. It's that preoccupation with beauty. But then here's the other one, preoccupation with success. Tell me if this sounds familiar. Okay, talking about success. Healthy things grow. So let's talk about how much we've grown recently and how much God must be behind us because we've grown. Maybe we should instead start talking about how much we've, how health, how healthy we've gotten instead of how much we've grown. Yeah. Cause if healthy things grow, that's great. But growth doesn't require you to do anything. Yeah. But the reason why it's not great is not only healthy things grow, cancer grows. Well, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Weeds grow. Lots of unhealthy things grow. Well, you could say it that way, but I mean, also like weeds themselves are healthy. They're just not healthy to it's the environment that, around them. It's not that I can say it that way. I did say it that way. Okay. <laughs> well, like cancer. Yeah. It's, it's terrible for your body. But in and of itself, it's healthy. No, it's itself. not because it's killing itself. It's a part of the body. <laughs> Come on, man. All I'm saying is that the organism itself is growing because it has its own healthy properties, but it is detrimental to the environment around it. So a narcissist can be super healthy themselves as far as, you know, they're wealthy, successful, yeah. all that stuff, but they're cancer or they are uh, manipulating and killing the environment around them. And that's the thing, though. They're a part of the body. So yes. if they're just healthy for themselves, they're actually destroying the body like a cancer just so that they can win. Yes. Right? Um, by the way, that was a great example of we don't have to agree because I didn't agree with Very a lot of that. I mean, you started agreeing with me at the end. Let's just be clear on that. That was really You just, came around to my uh, point of view. Mm, did I? <laughs> did I really? Uh, but no, it's, it's the preoccupation with success. It's, it's our, our, which list are we on? You know, the best Christian workplace, it's fastest growing church in America, largest church in America. I am so sorry. There are thousands of churches on different lists. If I can't get on one list, I just choose a different list. Someone else didn't try to get on. Yeah. Create a new list. We talk about all the time. We'll post on social media. Is it bad to post on social media how many salvations we had? No. But we're doing that just so people see we're successful. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm a marketing guy. Yeah. And so when you do something like that, 
Um, because I've run social media for several churches, several different several, several. It's just so you know, I'm not I'm not uh, reacting to a specific one, but it's a bunch of them. And every time I'm asked to do that, the question is, what's that for? Who's that for? So if you're running your social media from a marketing That's standpoint, right. who are you trying to reach? Are you trying to reach your own church people? Or are you trying to reach outside people? Because the outside people don't care how many people got saved at your church because mm-hmm. they're not saved yet. They don't see the value in that. That's right. So what's the point of that? It's like what you said. Is the it to point make yourself of it look better? Is normally to make ourselves look better to Christians down the street who are yes. going to a smaller church and haven't come over to the dark side yet, <laughs> right? No, the that's light what side. it's about. The no, light no. Side. Okay. there are no. lots no. of lights. No. No. There, and, and, and look, up. guys, there are, there are plenty of great mega churches. I'm not against mega churches, but think about this: all of the things from the preachers and sneakers, you know, stuff to getting the, you know, having had the nice clothes and the nice lineup and how I look on camera and all those things to what we're posting on social media. Um, let's let's be real, marketing. You know this. There are massive churches that paid for thousands of fake social media followers or social media followers that don't even live in the cities where they have churches or campuses Yes, because they care about how they look rather than reaching the people where they're called to do ministry, right? So all I'm saying is when you think about the uh, the special me piece, right, that preoccupation with, with power is harder to see. The preoccupation with beauty and success, it shows up all the time. In the modern church. All right, so special me, let's continue entitled. Very simple. There's nothing more to that. Entitled. But a lot of times it's entitled for our church. It's entitled for, you know, hey, we we deserve this. We should have been on that list. I can't believe I went to that event and they didn't have the right snacks in the green room. Yeah. Yeah. Bro, come on. Yeah. So, so far on this list, what I'm seeing is um, a lot of times – leaders will wrap themselves up in the identity of your church. So you look like, well, it's not me. It's, it's, you know, I, I, the church should have been on that list. The church should look good. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, but you wrapped yourself up in identity. And so on the inside, it's like, no, I should have been on that list because I'm leading the church. Oh yeah. Or, and so if the church is, then I am. Well, if the church is on the list, it's like an affront to my identity. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You know, all right. So let's continue the next one. Um, in special me, can only be around people who are important or special. Mm. And it goes back to, I actually sat with a pastor. This is real talk. I sat with a pastor offering to give them, um, and I've done this with quite a few pastors. So again, this isn't anybody specific. I sat with a pastor and offered to give them um, time for free every month as a part of my way of serving the greater kingdom. So, hey, four to six hours of anything I do in my business, um, I want to give it to you. You'd be surprised how many churches I had to offer that to before I found anybody to take to take me up on it because they all say, well, we can take care of it from the inside. Or if you're not within our denomination, then we don't need your help. When I, when I offer that to businesses, they snatch that up. Right. right? But I offered them that I said, I want to help in any way that I can. So anything that I offer for my business, you can have four to six, you know, free hours a month. And, And I kid you not pastor looked at me and said, well, Jeff, thank you. But I don't see how you have anything to offer us that we don't already have. Mm. You see, let me tell you who we're learning from, who's pouring into my life and started naming off celebrity pastor after celebrity pastor after celebrity pastor. By the time he got done, he wasn't even talking about celebrity pastors anymore. He's talking about, you know, John Maxwell and other authors and people like that. And all I could think about when I left was this guy really thinks that no one can help him except for this group of other celebrity pastors and famous people can only be around people who are important or special. That's not going to be all the time, but do they, do they, do they have a a lean toward that? Right. right. Or do they have the pastor's heart that wants to be around hurting people? Yeah. That wants to be around people who can't give them anything. You want to really know if a, if a pastor is in a good place or not, how often are they spending time with people who can't give them anything? Can't even afford to tithe enough to make a difference in their church. Yeah. Right. If you're spending time with those people, it's because you care about people. Right. Right, All right. So special me continues with I interpersonally exploitative for their own gain. Right. And that just means using people. Yeah. Fancy way for using people. So how do you guys see that exploitation and using people show up in the church most often? I mean, obvious answer is volunteers. Yeah. Uh, And I don't. To be clear, I don't think volunteering is. I, I kind of had some strong views on this lately, specifically. Just uh, lately. Just, just lately. Just. Well, I've really been thinking about it because uh, 
when you talk about volunteers and you're talking about, uh, we tend to in the church, and I've done this myself as a youth pastor, pastor, whatever, yeah. that we kind of think that volunteering in the church is the best way you can serve God. Oh, yeah. It's the end all. If you're not volunteering in church, then you're not really serving God on the level that you uh, that you should be. Yeah. When really, it's not about. I mean, it's not 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 to say that volunteering in the church is a bad thing, or that we don't need people to do it. It's not a bad thing, but it's not half of your purpose. Yes, it's right. not the only way yes. you can live out your purpose, dude. We have churches, that, and again, I keep saying this. This is a whole other podcast episode because we we have like seventy episodes already outlined out things that we'd love to talk about. Yeah. But I also just got a list of things that people wanted to hear us talk about yesterday, right? Mm -hmm. um, if you're a part of the Church Disrupted community, um, man, our, our catalysts and our table flippers, they get to tell us all the time like what they want to hear. And even some of the guests they want us to bring in to sit in one of the four chairs. We only got three today. We're going to have four a lot of times. Sometimes this chair is going to be – it's going to have a guest in it, Yeah, right? Yeah. You know? Um, but we think about those things, and, and when you go to a lot of churches, all you hear is, we want to help you find your purpose. Right. Yeah. We want to help you find your, your spiritual gifts. We want to help you live out the life as God chooses to live. And, and, and then they don't talk about when you go to their next steps or growth track or discover name of whatever church one-on-one, -on -one, right? When you go to that, all you find out is they're talking about tithing, they're talking about serving, they're talking about giving, and they're talking about baptism. That is it. And discovering your purpose and your spiritual gifts are only talked about in a way such as how can you serve on Sunday morning? Are you called to be a greeter? Are you called to work in the parking lot? Or are you called to work with kids? Because basically, we boiled it down to your purpose is how you can help our right. church. Yes. Now, as, so as an entrepreneur, you want to know what I've never heard a church talk about? how to live into your purpose as a kingdom entrepreneur, mm. right? How to live into your purpose as a ball coach. Yeah. A lot of times those are, those are part of the sermon series every once in a while. Like I've heard, I've heard, I've heard but specific messages. Not talk the about actual that. track where we help right. you find not your that, purpose. Not the big, not the big thing. It's just kind of like, like, Oh yeah, by the way, since you're not going to be here every day of the week, you can also do this. And by doing that, you can invite people back here. Sean, are you saying that my entire purpose is not wrapped up in just Sunday morning? That I have a yeah, purpose you, Monday you through, through Saturday? I might. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not, but maybe. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, but we talk about that, and, and I know somebody's going to be listening to this who is in Knoxville because that's where I live, and they're going to be like, I know what church you're talking about. No, you don't. No. Okay? Can I just tell you, I can go to over 100 churches right now, and what they're going to talk about in their growth track, next steps, discovery class, launch pad, what, there's so many stupid names, right? What they're going to talk about, they're going to talk about serving, they're going to talk about tithing, baptism, giving, all that, because it's a playbook. If your church does that, I'm not talking bad about your church. I'm saying there's a problem. The reason why I can say it, and I know it's not just your church, is because it's a playbook. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. a playbook where if you push the right buttons, you can manipulate people to the right actions. It's not a playbook we find in Scripture. It's one that's taught by organizations and other successful pastors. Growth Track is brought to you by other people's successes with tithing. You know, that that's right. what it is, yeah. but that interpersonal exploitation, interpersonal exploitation, and it, it's things like, Hey, you know, if, if you really want to see the kingdom grow, then you'll do it. Oh yeah. 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 So you talk about that. Talk about that, so, man. I, you know, I saw it in your eyes. <laughs> one of the, one of the really interesting things is, um, as I've done ministry over the years in lots of different communities and lots of different places, I literally would <clears throat> tell, you know, cause student ministry is what I've done. And I would always tell our students, you don't have to do things just inside these walls. The people outside of these walls need to be able to see Jesus. That's heresy. I'm so sorry. It's up to <laughs> this is one of those things we're not, gonna, we're not gonna agree on. But like that's what that's what I would tell people. I'd be as facetious as possible. Uh, I know, I know, I know. Um, but I would tell people, and our students would really be confused. So here in Tennessee, um, for them to get college credit or whatever, they would have to do service hours. Yeah. And a lot of times kids in the church would want to go back to their home church and serving kids ministry. Whereas I was encouraged them to let's go into downtown Chattanooga and let's go feed the homeless. Let's go to Nashville and paint some old lady's home who needs that. Wait a second. Homeless people and old ladies on our purpose. 
Our purpose is butts and seats. Our purpose is <laughs> baptism. Our purpose, here's the problem. We lose sight of our purpose when we count things that aren't our purpose. Yeah. yeah. And you know what we're never posting on social media, what we're never talking about at the business meeting, what churches are never celebrating? And I say never. Some actually are. Just very right. few. There are some. Yeah. We're not celebrating the amount of homeless people that we've served. We're not celebrating the amount of people who we've mobilized outside of our church with different organizations. Now, 501c3 organizations just within the community. We're not, we're not talking about, you know, the homeless shelters uh, that we're not talking about the amount of homeless people we've helped find sustainable housing or get jobs right. or, you know, and, and there's some of that, yeah. but it's almost an addendum to how many people do we have on Easter? Right. You know, and that's where that exploitation comes from. Of, of how many volunteers have you known who, man, that before you know it, they're all in, they're bought into the church, they love Jesus, and before you know it, they are serving four nights a week and on the verge of divorce because they're serving the church so much they're never with their family. Yeah. Yeah. How many pastors do you know whose marriages are in trouble because they're never home? Or that's all they talk about when they are home. Yeah, church. That's what we talk about around the family dinner table. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I, I when I was a youth pastor, I I got that you. Know, my wife finally said, "Hey, we we've got to set a time when we're not talking about this stuff." You mean your wife didn't want to talk about nothing but <laughs> youth ministry at your church? <laughs> to be fair, she she says the same thing about you know business stuff that I do now too. But because uh, I tend to I tend to live in that. But yeah, of course, yeah. you you got to have time for your family. That's that's apart from. You, what you do yeah. apart from your job or your volunteer hours. So let me just say this. And again, when I'm talking to pastors, I know that the people who need to hear this most are usually not listening to this podcast. Right? So when I'm talking to pastors, I'm talking to those of you that want to be better. You want to grow. You're not really the narcissistic pastor, but you know, you have those tendencies. The rest of the stuff we're talking about is so that the rest of our listeners, you can see those red flags and you can ask right. questions. You can yeah. push, you can find a church that's really healthy. But for the pastors that are listening, I, and I want to encourage you, it, Paul talks about it in Scripture. He says that the husband is supposed to love his wife like Christ loved the church. And if at any point you find yourself giving more of yourself to Christ's bride in the, the church and the organization and ministry than you're giving to your own bride, then something's wrong. Your first mm-hmm. ministry will always be to your family. And I'm telling you, if you go to a church and your pastor is never spending time with their family or they're always at the church, that is not a holy badge of honor. That means their priorities are misplaced. If you go to a church where there's always an event and people are always being asked to to go do something even good with their family, and they don't that, that church doesn't prioritize and prize giving people time with their families, something's wrong. We misplaced our priorities. All right, so special me. We've gotten through the S, the P, the E, and the C, and the I. Let's go to the A, arrogant. Arrogant. That one's that one's simple. We, we talked about a minute ago. I don't know. I don't see how there's anything that you could offer me. Arrogant. Yeah. I don't know if there's anything we can learn from that small church. Arrogant. Right? Um, hey, I, I know that you see some problems, volunteer, um, but you know I've got degrees in this, right? Yeah. You know that I went to, you know, like a, a Bible college. You know that I've been doing this for 30 years, right? And they, have you ever experienced that where a pastor or a church leader almost treats you as if you don't know anything because you're just a lay person? Yeah. Yeah. It's arrogance. It's arrogance. It's arrogance when you're preaching on the weekend and in your preaching, you're talking about how special your church is. Yeah. Of course, you're not downing anybody else's church, but you're giving backhanded compliments. You're talking about how your church is above and beyond. You know, I even think about it with the multi-site movement. And, and look, I've worked in the multi-site movement. There's a lot of good with the multi-site movement. Right. But how much hubris has to exist to believe that instead of calling a pastor from a community across your state or in a different state to plant an autonomous campus that you support, How much hubris does it take to say, instead of that, we should plant another campus that looks just like our campuses in other communities and pipe in video teaching because surely we're better at reaching people than any pastors who live there. Yeah. If more multi-site churches would become church planters rather than campus starters, I think we'd see a lot more change, a lot more positive impact on communities. Yeah. Well, and speaking as a marketer, again, uh, that's a terrible idea. To which one the to create campuses uh, across an area because the people are different even even here in Knoxville there's 
there's about 17 different demographics. Like you can have a kid. It's completely different. And I've done the demographic research here um, for that reason. Uh, and it's really, it, they're so different. And, and to place a, a mirror image or a copy campus, you can call it copy campus. I like yeah. that. Looks the same. It. Guys, it, did you it know, doesn't work. Looks the same. Has the same message. Has the same stuff on the walls. This is going to blow your mind. There are churches that have a scent. Yeah. Every campus has to smell the same. They're using the same freaking Glade plugins I, I'm, because I'm that's guilty. how the Holy Spirit moves. I'm guilty of trying to uh, create a church scent. You know, it, like there are, we're we're all guilty of being stupid. I mean, <laughs> I just wanted a I I'm just sorry, wanted a really Sean, cool I'm church sorry. scent. But uh, and, yeah, look and seriously, there's nothing wrong with that. But when we get to that point, are we thinking about the wrong things? Are you telling me that that's what we're putting brain power on? And look, if it's a big church that has somebody full time marketing, that's one thing. Yeah. Right. But there are churches that are trying to do this with just a few staff. There are churches that are doing this and putting staff resources and dollars into that when they're not reaching their own community. So, again, not feeding the homeless, not taking care of right. widows and orphans, which what does scripture say? Pure and undefiled religion is this to take care of widows and orphans. So, anyway, we get past the arrogance to special me lack of empathy. Lack of empathy. And again, you'll see lack of empathy show up more with interactions with staff members yeah. than you will with um, individuals in the church. Because again, pastors would not be in ministry long if they weren't charismatic and they couldn't make people feel like they love them. Right. Mm -hmm. But I'll say this, and, and Corey, you, know, you were a volunteer, so you haven't seen this as much quite as like Sean and I have. We both worked on church staffs, but you've seen it just by being close to staff members, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. It's crazy the way that pastors and church leaders will talk about other pastors and church leaders on their same staff, right? I'm, I'm going to throw this out there. Pastors, would you be willing to open up your email or to open up your text messages and let people read them publicly? Or would you be embarrassed the way that you've talked about some people? Lack of empathy. I've heard this, man. I, I think it's a lack of empathy. That person can't be on stage because they're fat. Yeah, I've heard that too. How? I think is that, that also like goes Jesus. back to the other one, the, the beauty. Yeah, uh, was yeah. the yeah. well. The so beauty. many of these, yeah. so many of these overlap. It's yeah. the hey, you know, it's, it's the pastor who look it, it, in church. Are we going to have to fire people just like any other time? Yeah, yeah, right. But there's a difference in firing people, and so many stories of pastors, men and women who aren't even in the ministry anymore because of how they got fired. Mm -hmm. There's no moral failure. You're not doing a bad job. We've decided to go to go a different way for whatever reason. We don't want you to be here, and we are so cold to you. Yeah. When we're telling you you're let go, we don't want to talk to you. We don't. We, and then we give you a paper that says you can't come back to our church, but we'll give you some money and support your family if you don't ever say anything bad about us and then you're totally disconnected from yeah. your entire community, there's no empathy yeah. in that. I have in the consulting world, especially I've talked to some pastors and say, Hey, it's okay if you want to fire this person, they probably don't belong here. But one is the church. You need to give the most generous severance. Right. You need to make sure their family's taken care of. You need to help them to find another job where they will fit. And here's what I always remind them. They are still a sheep in your flock. That fired staff member is still a church member until they find their next home, which means you got to care for that sheep. So if you aren't willing to walk with them more closely with more love in this season, then you aren't ready to fire them. Right. Lack of empathy. All you right. Know, special me. On, yeah, on that, yeah. I, I've been on both sides of that. Uh, I've been let go uh, a couple of times. And uh, one time it was with a lot of empathy. Mm. Well, it wasn't at first, and then you know, some mistakes were realized, and they came back and they corrected it, and it meant everything to me. Dude, that's awesome. It changed everything. And then there was another time where it was the exact opposite, and so you know, being on both sides of that, you know, you can show empathy mm. when you're letting somebody go. It is possible, even if it wasn't oh, yeah. done in the right way in the first place, you can come back and correct yeah. that mistake. Right. So you're saying a pastor actually they fired you or had a bad conversation with you. There was no empathy. They came back around and apologized. They yes. came back around and like they, they changed something, changed direction to make it right. And, and not just, not just apologize, but followed up with action. Wow. And, and, and I, it's not because I went to them and said, Hey, you really hurt me. They just realized their mistake and said, Hey, I realized this wasn't handled the right way. I am so sorry. We're going to make it right. We're going to, not only that, they took care of our family. 
That's and they awesome. really, they really made a difference. And so that's awesome. Hey, yeah. pastors, pastors that are listening at this point, that man, that's it. Yeah. That looks like Jesus. You don't have to get it right up front, but sure. when you realize you got it wrong, man, come back around, mm-hmm. do your best to make it right. All right. The last two in special me must be admired. How many times have we seen those pastors, man? Or it, it, sometimes it's just church leaders, directors of ministries. I have to look good. I have to be well thought of. I have to be admired or I'm going to go on a rampage. Yeah. I'm going to be in a bad mood and everybody's going to feel it. Wait, I, I still remember you know, working on one staff and uh, we would take a survey every year, you know, to get on one of the, you know, top places to work list. Right. And those are in every industry. I hate those lists. They're all gamed, right? Yeah. They're all gamed and employees. There's so much data out there that employees don't feel comfortable. Um, being honest on them. They don't think they're anonymous, right? They're not. Um, I, I talk to business leaders about this all the time, but that list came out every year. Usually the survey landed this church on the list, um, but it was well known. If the survey results weren't good, even if you got on the list, if they weren't as good as they wanted them to be, that senior pastor would be in a pouty crybaby toddler mood for the next three months. And they would take it out on every single person on staff. It was like a witch hunt with a smile to find out who said bad things. Let's have like ministry departments meet and let's, let's just talk. Hey, you know, you three guys in youth ministry, we just want to make sure, you know, our, our survey results weren't good. We, we want to help make sure this is a great place to work. So, um, yeah, tell us how we can improve. And the whole time they're just writing notes, like who, who's, who's given us input that makes us think they may have made a bad comment or right. left yeah. a bad result. Right. And it was terrible. So what happened? Eventually people started telling them on the surveys what they wanted to hear because nobody wanted to deal with the toddler temper tantrum of a 50 plus year old pastor. At some point we got to grow up in ministry. You know, I'll say that I've never worked in ministry and you know, that'd been my primary employment, but I have been in workplaces where you've done those type of um, reviews and tried to get your company on the list. Yep. And even in those places, when there's a less than admirable uh, comment, it's amazing how much better those companies have handled it than I've heard of churches doing it. Like I've heard of companies, I made some very negative comments once to a company that I worked for. And it was not, it, it was nowhere near as um, discreet as, as I was under the impression it was. Mm-hmm. So I got a very Uh-oh. uncomfortable conversation what it did is it opened the opportunity for those things to be reviewed and for someone to ask me questions about my experiences. So while I was concerned initially, what was, what happened was that it was a very admirable way that it was handled. And those concerns, I was able to get all those things that I was concerned about addressed and resolved without feeling like, you know, my job was in jeopardy or that, suddenly that things, or I was going to have to deal with someone who's all pouty. And it's amazing how much different the church has handled those. And that I've, you know, I've known a lot of people who've worked on staffs mm-hmm. of churches in lots of different cities and lots of different States. Yeah. But it's amazing how much differently I've heard of that being handled mm-hmm. in those environments than I have even experienced myself. You know why? Why? Because when we're in the church and you feel called to ministry, and you're in you you're, you're a pastor you're you're a minister you're a ministry leader director our identity gets tied to our calling it is way easier for a business leader to fix it because their identity is not called to you know their identity is not completely tied to what they do right if my business goes under tomorrow you know what i'll do start another one yeah i mean Dude, my, my, my identity is not tied to that. When I was a pastor, there was a long time, like I'll fully admit it. There was a long time where my identity was who I was as a student pastor at that time. And I remember telling my therapist, I said, I feel like I'm one mistake away from every person in my life walking away. He said, Jeff, what do you mean? You're surrounded by people who love you. And I said, yeah, but if I left the church that I'm at right now, Mm -hmm. how many of those friends are real? Yeah. How many would walk away? If I made the wrong mistake, would my, would my wife leave me with all these things? But what we came to was a lot of it was tied to identity, much more so in the church, even than personally, right? Because I thought the people who loved me, cared about me, everything was only because of what I did, right? you know? So I, that, that just gets into, into huge pieces. And then the last one, special me, envious of others and believe that others are envious of them. 
I can't tell you how many pastors I know who it's like, they're always looking over their shoulder. They always think people are looking at them. Pastors of churches, pastors of especially evangelical churches. It is worse than the evangelical movement. Um, And again, I work across all denominations. It's definitely worse. Pastors in evangelical churches are like the middle schoolers of ministry. They think everybody's looking at them all the time. And the truth is nobody cares because they're too busy looking at themselves. That's churches. But we think the other church and pastor down the streets looking at us and judging us and, you know, and we're, we're looking at them and we're envious of what they have that we don't have. And it's just, it's crazy how that envy gets in there. Now, a lot of this is not easy to see. Some of these things are easier to see as a parishioner than they are with others. Others, it's really hard to see if you're not on staff, but all of these things are, they're, they're basically examples of narcissism. Yeah. Right. So the next time you're wondering, Hey, is this leader really narcissist or not? Don't just label them a narcissist. Go through special me and ask, are they fitting these criteria, right? The nine traits of narcissism. I'll give them to you one more time all at once. Sense of self-importance, preoccupation with power, beauty, success, entitled, can only be around people who are important or special, interpersonally exploitative for their own gain, arrogant, lack of empathy, must be admired and envious of others, right? That's what it is. Um, And and I'll tell you this. You want to know how to handle a narcissist when you come into contact with one? Because that's the tough part. If you can recognize that your church leader is a narcissist early enough, you can just leave. Yeah. But if you're on the spiritual abuse side of a narcissist, they don't want to let you go. They want to control the narrative. They want to control what people think about them. The number one way to wrestle control away from a narcissist is to cut their control of you with boundaries and truth. Yeah. Here are clear boundaries I'm going to put up. These are the things I will do. These are the things I won't do. These are the things that are not going to fly. They're not healthy, right? And then tell the truth. Nothing will piss a narcissist off more than when you tell the truth. I've had, man, I've had ones that wanted to control everything that was going on. And the moment that we started telling the truth and not not sharing their narrative, they left us alone, right? Mm -hmm. They were no longer trying to control it. Um, Unfortunately, what do we learn in churches a lot of times? We, We get guilted into don't tell the truth. You don't want to hurt the bride. You don't want to make people who don't know Jesus think badly about the church. We essentially tell people, if if you say anything bad about the church, you're going to be responsible for people going to hell. Yeah. So then we don't say anything. We feel guilty and we let the narcissist keep us control. So if you feel like you're in a situation with a narcissist where you need to gain back control, especially with spiritual abuse, okay, clear boundaries, tell the truth. That's all you got to do. You'll wrestle back control. So let's talk about spiritual abuse and then we'll just get into, Hey, how can we, how can we handle some of these things? How can we move forward? How can we make it better? We've talked about hush money. We talked about narcissism. Spiritual abuse is a really long definition. I don't think we talked about hush money yet. We just mentioned it. Oh no, we talked about hush money. Yeah. We talked about hush money because it was such a simple definition. It was, Oh, the, well, we uh, talked yeah. about the definition yes. of it. Yeah. Yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. 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 So the, the spiritual abuse definition is like paragraphs. So yeah. we're just going to hit highlights of this. We're yeah, going to kind of go idea. through this. Um, we can put it in the show notes where you can you know, find some links to look up more stuff, but Spiritual abuse, let's just be frank. It's not just general church hurt. It's not just getting your feelings hurt. Spiritual abuse is a form of emotional and psychological abuse. It's like anything else. I have PTSD both from growing up in um, some abusive situations in my home and from spiritual abuse. And they have affected me on the insides in very, very similar ways. Yeah. Right? The the triggers are a lot of times the same. Um, but Spiritual abuse can be characterized by a systematic pattern of coercive and controlling behavior in a religious context. Those are the key words, coercive or controlling. Yeah. It doesn't, it could be about things you do, you know, um, different like moral stands that they take, but it could also just be about controlling your time as a volunteer, Mm -hmm. coercing how you think, coercing the story that you tell anytime Someone is asking you to tell a story or a lie to make people look good or to hide the truth. That's coercion. Yeah. Okay. So that's a big piece of it. Spiritual abuse can have deeply damaging impact on those who experience it. Okay. And all of this is coming from a recent book that I read, Escaping the Maze of Spiritual Abuse. Right. Tons of good stuff there. But this abuse may include, I'm going to give you the big long list real quick, Uh um, and then we'll talk about it. Manipulation exploitation, 
enforced accountability, censorship of decision-making, requirements for secrecy and silence, coercion to conform, inability to ask questions, control through the use of sacred text or teaching, requirement of obedience to the abuser, the suggestion that the abuser has a divine position, isolation as a means of punishment, superiority, and elitism. Which ones of those stick out to you guys? What have you seen most? Uh, well, yeah, I've seen all of them. Isolation, I think, sticks out, but I- I'm not sure I've seen isolation as much as a like a form of control. It's just more of a byproduct of what happens because I've seen so many pastors who have gotten fired or mm-hmm. staff members, and not only does nobody talk to them from the church anymore, but nobody talks to their kids. Like all the oh, yeah. kids, all I mean, their kids are feeling it. The, the yeah. whole family. So it, it yeah. brings about a sense of isolation. Because as a byproduct of all of that other stuff yeah. going on. Well, and it doesn't always have to be for control. Right. right. But part of that is on the front end. If you see people being isolated, then you know if I leave or if I speak up, I may mm-hmm. lose my entire community. So it's both tied to control and not. But yeah. I've experienced it, man. I mean, mm-hmm. my, my wife and I lost our community overnight. There are people who have said they loved us for a really long time who, dude, they won't talk to us. Yeah. They blocked us on social media. Right there, there's an entire staff at a church that's not allowed to talk to us. It's been made very clear. But you talk about the kids, it's one thing. I can handle it. I can handle it. But when it affects my kids, when Mm -hmm. they're losing their community, when people aren't checking on them, um, when it's causing them to, you know, in some ways get really cynical to the church, that's a bigger deal. I think Jesus talked about that. Something about, you know, hey, go drown yourself in a river. (laughs) Um, That's the Jeff paraphrase, right? But it's a big deal when you hurt those little ones. And we don't think about what spiritual abuse to parents does to, to kids. Right. Yeah. Right. So isolation, what else sticks out? I I think something that I was thinking as you were reading that list was by and large, the basis for the deconstruction movement, whatever you want to call it is this list. Oh yeah. It's, it's, it's this. So if if you ask, I'd say, and I can't, this isn't, this isn't facts verified, but, I would say nine times out of 10, if you ask somebody why they're deconstructing, mm. whether, whether that's just like, Hey, I'm trying to figure out what I believe, or I just, I don't believe anything anymore. It has something to do with something on this list. Oh yeah, for sure. And I mean, things like manipulation mm-hmm. are so widespread, but what did it start with? The authors of escaping the maze of spiritual abuse, they said, this causes deep damage. Yeah. yeah. Right. There is such a thing as spiritual PTSD. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. out there. Yeah, we'll we'll talk to people about it. And, and and pastors and church leaders will say it's not that big of a deal. You're making a mountain out of a molehill. You're making this bigger than it really is. Look, and, and you guys have probably seen this post on social media. I don't know who to credit it to, I, but I remember seeing it. Something along the lines of um, when I tell you that you've hurt me, you don't get to say, no, I didn't. Right. Yeah. Right. You may not even agree with it, but the amount of times that we have people in church settings that they hear something like this and they say, hey, Grow up. Don't make such a big deal out of it. You need to calm down. Again, you need to check your heart. Don't let a root of bitterness grow up. All of the things. And then you add on to it the guilt of, think about all the people that will go to hell if you make the church look bad. Now, do they they say it like that? No. But that's the implication. I mean, sometimes they say it like that. (laughs) I mean, just to be clear, I mean, sometimes I've seen people say, well, you're making... How many people are going to walk away from the church because of what you're doing or because of the truth that you're telling or your perceived truth or whatever it, they say? I mean, I've seen it. Crazy. People, short of saying you're sending people to hell, but essentially. Well, here's the problem. The, it, when people say that or imply that, those church leaders or those Christians have such a low view of God, I want no part of their faith. Mm. Zero. Yep. If I can do anything to cause someone to go to hell, then I can also do things by extension to get them into heaven. Yeah. And last time I checked, I can't even control myself. Yeah. I'm screwing up all the time. I'm not responsible for anybody going to heaven or hell. Yeah. God will use me. God will use me in people's life. But dude, the guilt, the spiritual shame, that itself is a deep manipulation that will stick to your core. I can't tell anybody about what happened. Yeah. Because think about the people who go to hell. Let's let's make this a you know uh, just take it a little farther. Spiritual abuse can be sexual abuse. Mm-hmm. Of course, not all sexual abuse is spiritual abuse. Right. 
we have a whole lot of people who will say spiritual abuse isn't real. It's just a bunch of snowflake Christians who get their feelings hurt, get their panties in a bunch about nothing. It's not a big deal. They need to get over it. But we'd all agree, right? I think we would all agree. I've never met a person that would say sexual abuse is okay in the church. That's a huge problem. Yeah. And it should never happen for any reason. Mm -hmm. Yet if you watch the Secrets of Hillsong documentary, you'll see that there are people who didn't say anything for a long time about spiritual abuse. There were kids who went to parents and said, I am being sexually abused by a pastor. And those parents would say things like, now think about all the good that man's done. Yep. You don't want people who don't know Jesus to think bad of the church, do you? You don't want to be the one responsible for ruining his ministry. Not just kids. You go back and you look through church history, and you're going to find in the last 50 years a lot of women who were sexually assaulted by pastors who were yeah. told the same thing. Again, why are people watching The Secrets of Hillsong in such droves? Why are they watching um, shiny, happy people? Yeah, right. All of these documentaries are coming out. It's because so many people have experienced that shame that I have to hide because I don't want to be responsible for someone going to hell. Anytime someone makes you feel that way, they are hyper abusive and you need to get out of the situation. Well, I, I want to say something that seems like it should be extremely obvious. If you say something is happening, it's not you that are turning people away. If that does happen, it's the person who did the abusing in the first place. Right. Oh, yeah. A hundred percent. I mean, that seems like it's a no brainer, but a lot of times we forget that. Like, well, I don't want to, if I post this on social media, or if I say this story to somebody then I might be responsible for them turning away. But the person who initially did the abusing is the one who should be responsible. That pastor who was sexually abusing kids, he's the one who's responsible oh, for yeah. turning people away from Jesus, not the person who's speaking out. Me telling the truth about sin that was committed by someone else, pain that was, was perpetrated by someone else. That's not my fault. Yeah. It's their fault. Here, I, So I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to look right in the camera right now and challenge you. When we stay silent and when we stay quiet, that's when we play a role in the abuse. Yeah. Right. And guys, I'm not trying to make you feel bad. I'm not trying to make you feel ashamed. There's a ton of reasons why you would stay quiet. I stayed yeah. quiet for years. I completely understand it. But part of the reason why I'm doing what I'm doing now is because I know that when I stay silent, I allow it to happen again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When I actually yep. say something, then people can say, no, 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 that's not okay. We've seen that happen before. They can see it coming. But when we stay silent, we allow spiritually abusive leaders to continue to abuse. Now, I don't think every spiritually abusive leader should be removed from ministry. Mm -hmm. If they're willing to admit the, the abuse and they're willing to repent and work on it, then dude, we all make mistakes. Now there are certain things like, look, yeah. any, any sort of sexual abuse, you're done. You're disqualified yes. from ministry. Let's, let's be real. But if, if, if it's just, Hey, you got a, you know, manipulation or coercion and we can prove this pattern. If you'll admit to it, like the yeah. pastor did to you, then man, you don't have to miss a day in ministry. Right. My problem is not with pastors that abuse. I've even abused. My problem is with pastors who can't recognize abuse or repent when it's brought to them. Yeah. They'll die on that hill. Not only would they die on that hill, they'll turn themselves into victims. Pastors who abuse people are not being persecuted. You're not being no. persecuted because you love Jesus or because you're a man of God. You're being persecuted because you did stupid stuff and you hurt people. Yeah. Right. That's not persecution. That's consequences. Right. I think you missed something there, but what they also need to be submitted to, um, to there's, there should be some sort of an authority looking in on that to make sure that abuse doesn't happen again. Yeah. So if there is abuse that's happening, I, I agree. You don't always have to be set down and removed from that ministry, but there should be some sort of a plan put in place to make sure that doesn't keep happening. Yeah. Unfortunately, a lot of times there's not enough accountability. We've got that's fake true. boards sham boards, boards that are scared to death of having to run that large church if you know if, if a pastor's removed. And there's not accountability. Right. There's not even accountability. I mean, guys, you know this. There's not even accountability for people to have conversations to even face someone who says, I've been spiritually abused. I think mm -hmm. I've been spiritually abused. But I say all that to just say there are a lot of people who have been made to think I'm crazy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Something's wrong with me. I'm just being soft. When they had been abused in such a way that in any other arena of life is criminal. Yep. Yeah. Okay. I actually have yeah. to do training. A lot of times just did one recently with a youth ministry team. We have to do a training on mandatory reporting mm -hmm. in the state of Tennessee. 
there are no mandatory reporters because everybody is lawfully required to report. Right. Everybody, right? Yep. And did you know you are lawfully required to report? It is criminal to see emotional abuse and not report it. Mm, I didn't know that. It's great. It's criminal. I didn't know that, right? Yeah. I did know that, and it's been difficult, but there have been times when I've had to re report abuse. Yeah. And it wasn't until I was trained to know that that I even realized that that was a criminal issue that I was ignoring. Yeah. No, it's a, like we show it. If you actually go through the uh, Tennessee Department of Children's Services, they have a training on it. They have slides where it shows you the law. It is comes with civil penalty. It is a criminal act to not report that. Yet in churches, we don't talk about it. It's adults. It's not kids. And we don't think about it. This is deeply damaging stuff. We're trying to take the stigma away from spiritual abuse. Yeah. If you have been spiritually abused, you are not being soft you are not being sensitive. You have been mistreated by people who represent Jesus in a way that Jesus would never treat people. Well, and to say to pastors, just like it happened with me, it, it can be fixed. Most of this stuff can be fixed with a conversation and maybe some action behind it. Not everything can be fixed with the conversation. Let's be clear on that. I mean, there's some stuff that, like you said, there's some things that it's like, hey, you're just done with ministry. You just have to be, you, you've got, you've gone over the way too far over the line right. and you're done yeah. and you can be restored. We need to say this. Yeah. You can be restored as a person. You can always be restored as a man or woman of God. Mm -hmm. That doesn't necessarily mean you should be restored to a pastoral leadership role. Right. Yeah. That, that, that's a high calling. And I think we're, res I want to give the benefit of the doubt and restore pastors anywhere that we can. Yeah. But I think we're restoring way too many pastors. There are some that have made it clear that's not your role anymore. Yeah, but you know, if if, if you if you take some action and re and really get behind it, it, you can fix a lot of stuff. You can fix the system, and and when you fix, start fixing these kinds of systems. We start fixing the mm -hmm. spiritual abuse and the narcissism and all that stuff. When you start fixing that, you'll start to see your church be healthy. You'll start to see it grow beyond whatever it did before. Even if it's not necessarily you're growing to like ten thousand people or twenty thousand people, you might be growing in your community. You might be growing in other ways because you're healthy. You see that numerical growth isn't the only form of growth. Yeah. Yeah. But it takes conversations mm -hmm, right. and that's what this is all about. So, you know, Hey, episode one, we, and we could go so far, we could do multiple episodes on just spiritual abuse. Yeah. We could do multiple episodes on just narcissism. Probably couldn't do multiple episodes just on hush money, but man, we could have we could a do fire. One full one. We could have a fire <laughs> episode on hush money. But the reason why we started with this is, is we wanted to start episode one to say, the stuff we're talking about, I realize there are going to be some people who say, Jeff, you're being too soft. You're being too sensitive. We've got this church hurt, victim mentality, spirit call, everything abuse mindset. And that's just hurting the world. That's hurting the church. And I need you to know the stuff we're talking about. It's not those things. It's not those things. It's actual, real, traumatizing and damaging abuse. Okay, it's narcissistic tendencies that are leaving a mark that will settle on people sometimes forever. We talked about yeah. you can't always move on. Yeah, you can just move forward. Right. So you know, hey, I know not everybody's going to agree with us, but I, I would challenge you with this: if you've listened this far and you're still mad and you think, you know what, these guys they just want to call everything abuse, they just want to label everybody a narcissist, they want to do that. I love you, and at the same time. I believe that that attitude is contributing to abuse every day. I believe that attitude is part of the problem. So if that's you, we're probably not the podcast for you, but I would, I would really challenge you to look into yourself and say, why is it that I find myself attacking people when they say they've been abused or mistreated? Even if they're, they're somewhat wrong, right? If we don't first listen, we can't learn. Right. And when we say, oh, they're just playing the victim card or, oh, they're just labeling people as abusive, they're just, you know, they need to check their heart, all those sort of things. Guys, that is an attack. It's a whitewashed attack on someone who said, I've been abused. And the answer is, no, let me tell you what's wrong with you. And it's just another version of gaslighting that does deep, deep damage. So let's talk about this as we kind of wrap up this episode We've talked a lot about where these things, spiritual abuse, narcissism, where they show up in the church. Why do you think they show up in the church? Why does narcissism, spiritual abuse, hush money, all these things, why are these toxic behaviors showing up in the church so much today? I don't think it's just today. 
to be honest. I think it's yeah. been happening all the way through. I mean, you you see Paul writing to about other pastors and other church planters who are doing these mm-hmm. things that they shouldn't be doing. Uh, he may not have gone into complete specifics on every detail, but I mean, there's always been stuff. And I think it comes down to um, it's a different form of power. Mm. It's it, it feels different than like governments have certain power over their people. Kings have power over people. And it, I mean, you see that in those situations as yeah. well. I think it's kind of the same thing. Like a business owner doesn't have the same power over an employee or even a consumer mm. as a, a pastor would because there's a deeper connection that's a spiritual connection. Whenever we think of spiritual connections, we think of something very deep with inside of us. Yeah. And it's so hard to leave. I mean, if you just started a church, you say, wow, these people are crazy. I'm leaving. That's easy. You've been at church for 20 years and you're like, I'm starting to see some really bad behaviors, but I'm going to stick it out. That's because my family. I'm, I'm deeply ingrained in this. And I think that's why you see it. It's because, and you know, I, th- I think nepotism plays a huge role in it as well. And nepotism isn't just family. It's friends, and 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 that's. I think that's how it creeps in. I think there's some really good intentions at the at the forefront with the lead pastor and all that, and then you get uh, family friends who you trust in there, and maybe they're not given an opportunity to go outside and really learn what it means to be outside yeah. and fail. They, they, sometimes people aren't given the opportunity to fail when they need to be failures. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and I think you're right. It's not nepotism is not just family. Yeah. We've actually got an entire episode coming later on talking about inbreeding in the church. Yeah. <laughs> and it's that kind of stuff, man. It goes down to even the ideas that yeah. we believe, yeah. right? The the people that we listen to. What what about you, Corey? Why do you, why do you think this is showing up so much right now? I think that we live in a day and age where there's so much more recording and there's mm-hmm. so much more openness. Like it's not uncommon for someone to go to their special group of friends on TikTok and talk about their struggles in life. Yeah. It's not uncommon for someone to have a YouTube page that where they're talking about and they're talking to people who they may never know in real life. So we, we as a culture are recording these things more now. Mm -hmm. So the things that used to be kept in the dark are now being put in front and out front and center. The things that used to be happening where no one was recording and discussing are now being publicly discussed. So it's not that it's something that's new. Like we all know that like you were talking about Paul, but also there were times when there have been completely rewritten texts, Hmm. removing words, removing things that are not what someone may want to hear to disguise and to make them feel that, Yes, this is exactly the way God said what he said, Mm -hmm. when really all they've done is remove some words and alluded to some things to make you fall in the line. And there are, you know, we there historically there have been texts found where there have been passages, chapters and books removed. Yeah, Mm -hmm. because it doesn't line up with what someone believes. And it's I I would see say even way bigger than anything that's been removed. You know, I when we translate certain versions of scripture, yeah. which translation does your church use? The translators are making decisions that sometimes there are specific words that maybe for centuries have been translated in one way. And we make very intentional decisions to translate them differently because mm-hmm. we don't like the theological implications of the way they were translated. And and when I say that, most people think, oh yeah, it's all those liberal Christians (laughs) wanting to get a new liberal translation. Most of the time it's actually conservative denominations and translators that are behind it. Even with things like women in ministry, you know, Hey, how can we translate this in a different way? How can we make some different decisions? Right. Um, I, you know, I think why it's showing up so much now is because I think we care so much about image. Yeah. Yeah. See, I, I actually do think it's worse. And I, I, you guys have, have this fantastic perspective, but I think it's worse right now because we've never cared more about how we look because we've got a persona on Instagram and Facebook and TikTok and YouTube and everybody wants influence and everybody wants to be an influencer and we care so much. I just, I cannot fathom that 50 years ago, preachers were even thinking about, I got to get that line up or the new sneaks before I go preach. I don't know. I mean, you, you you've got the the. I grew up in. You wear your best to search on Sunday. Yeah, true. You know, they might they might have got the the newest suit. 
Yeah. But die. that would, but that was yeah. everybody. Yeah. Right. If anything, the pastor, you know, would, would, would do less of that. But I think there's also so much about, it's not just the way we look physically. It's, we want to control what people think about us. Yeah. And when you, when you are worried and you were consumed with what people think about you or they think about your church. Um, and I'm not just talking about church leaders. I'm talking to everybody who's listening. When you're w- consumed with what people think about you, you can't serve anybody. And you can't be you. You can't show up authentically if you're worried about what people think. And God has never called us to be anything but authentic. Mm-hmm. Yep. Man, I I think that's what's causing it. And And to have some empathy... Pastors, especially of larger churches right now, and if you take it even farther, not just larger churches, but um, maybe they've they followed their dad or their uncle or someone else in ministry, there is so much pressure to grow the church, to look good, to not let my people down, to not let my family down, to not yeah. mess up what the pastor before me did. There's so much pressure. Yet what did Jesus say? He said, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy burdened. Right? Yeah. Yeah. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. And uh, I think it's that all consuming struggle with we want to control what people think about us that leads pastors into this place because that's all insecurity. And insecurity leads you to do one thing I've got to fight back for control because control makes me feel secure. If we could have more secure people in the pulpit, we would have less spiritual abuse. We'd have more people willing to own up to it. So, again, pastors that are listening, and I wish every pastor would be in therapy. I wish every pastor would have a therapist, even if you're just seeing them once a month. Because, man, if we can get healthy and we can get secure, yeah, we don't really have anything to prove. So yeah. kind of last question. It's a two-part question, but I just want you to speak really to the listener right now, um, to people who are watching this on YouTube, listening on Spotify, whatever. Um, we see these things. We know they're wrong. Many people have seen these in their own churches. A lot of our listeners, tons of our listeners have experienced these kind of abuses. They've been on the receiving end of narcissism. They've, they've been offered the hush money. Maybe they regret taking it, right? right? Maybe they didn't and they're hurting because they didn't. What can we do about things like spiritual abuse and narcissism in the church? And more importantly, beyond what can we do, how can people move forward after they've been spiritually abused? That's a good one. And I know this this is just an opening salvo. Right. This is episode one. We're gonna talk a ton in our community beyond the episodes, ton of the episodes about specific ways to heal. Um, but just as someone's beginning to engage in healing, what would you say to help them? You know, hey, what can we do about this and how can you move forward? I think uh talking is really important. You have to have people around you to be able to discuss those things that hurt. Yeah. As long as we are keeping it in the dark, you won't heal from it. Mm-hmm. So if you can put a voice to those pains, if you can put a voice to those struggles, like that's something that's been really key for me as I've been healing from things from childhood was, you know, the relationship that we've built here. I've had a safe place to talk about those things. Yeah. I've had a lot of safe people for me to have those conversations from therapists to pastors to friends. I found really safe people for me to have conversations with. And it's been something that's been able to, I've been able to heal through those conversations, but more importantly, it's empowered me to be able to be that for other people. Yeah. So that's what these communities are going to be about is for us to create safe places for people to have those conversations. Yeah. Yeah. Well, because it's not, you know, sometimes I can feel like gossip, but it's not gossip because you're not having conversations with everybody. Right. You're having deep conversations with people you can trust or in safe spaces. And that's, you know, Church Disrupted, uh, all of our online communities, it really is about that. It's places you can tell your story where people aren't going to judge you, but they're also not allowed to trash the church. Yeah, They're not allowed to trash individual people. Um, but I, I think telling our story, I mean, it's so good. Telling our story does two things, though. One is it helps us process and heal. Mm-hmm. The other thing is when we tell our story, it allows other people to listen and say, okay, now that I know what's happened, I can recognize these things when I see them right. happen in my own life, my own faith community, my, my own self, yeah, my own self. We have, I bet almost every single podcast host that we have in our hosting community could look back and say, I've got examples of where I've spiritually abused people, mm-hmm. where I've mm-hmm. abused people, where I've gaslit people close to me. Um, again, it's not the end of the world when we know that. And when we have these conversations, 
I'm not just thinking, oh, that pastor did you wrong. That church member did you wrong. I'm also thinking, man, I, I do stuff like that. Sometimes I need to, I need to begin to look inside myself and see how I can be better. So I I think it's a double edged sword that's powerful with those conversations. Sean, Mm -hmm. what about you, man? What, what would you tell the person who's, man, they want to make a difference uh, with, with church or they're just trying to walk out the beginning of a healing process. I think there's two things. Uh, I think a lot of times we forget to lean into God in those moments. And that, that doesn't mean like you're going to, you got to study the Bible from 6 a.m. to 8 a.m. And you have to have two hours. You just got to lean into them. Just yeah. be like, hey, uh, and the first step is to realize that God didn't hurt you. And I know earlier I said that's Christianese, but it's true in that sense. Like God didn't actually hurt you. But he um, cares about the hurt. He cares going. about the hurt you're going through. And uh, while they're, People would say, yeah, he could have stopped it if he wanted to, and he could have, and maybe there was a re- there, I mean, there's a reason he didn't. I don't know what that can is. I, can I challenge something there? Yeah. What if the way God wants to stop it is us standing up and saying that's not okay? Yeah, absolutely. I think that – and and like your hurt, like for instance, your hurt, my hurt, Corey's hurt is a catalyst because we're here trying to help other people who are going through that. Mm-hmm. And if I hadn't experienced that hurt, I won't have the same perspective as I do right now. Yeah. But uh, lean into God and then um, build a community that you can have conversations, like Corey said, but also of people who carry you when you can't walk because there are going to be times in the healing process where you just – you can't get out of bed maybe or you can't yeah. you can't go to church. You're like, I can't even step foot in a building. doesn't mean you hate God or you've walked away from your faith. But you, you, Well, you were there the first yeah. time I tried to go back to church yeah. after the latest church hurt we went through, and I've spent my whole life in church. Yeah. Came to a church you and your wife invited us to, and dude, I – I was just trying not to throw up through the entire service. I was yeah. that sick and nervous and not, mm-hmm. not myself. Um, I love what you said though. You, when you talk about, you know, not just perspective, but leaning into God, oftentimes what we do, and I, I mean, I'm guilty of this mm-hmm. when I've hurt the most, especially with church hurt. Yeah. It's when I go to God the least, mm-hmm. it's so easy to stop praying entirely. Yeah. It's so easy to stop reading my Bible entirely. Yeah. It's so easy to stop telling people how I'm really doing. Hey, how are you doing? I'm, I'm okay. I told more people I was doing well when they knew my life was falling apart, and I didn't do it on purpose. I would just yeah. – it was a go-to. So, I mean, I, I, I would encourage listeners, uh, double down on what you said because yeah. I think it's so powerful. When you've gotten hurt, don't run away from Jesus because people weaponize Jesus against you. But a hundred percent talk about it. A hundred percent get get healing. A hundred percent protect yourself from things like that in the future. But when we want to be in the Bible the least, when we want to pray the least, when we want to meditate the least, and, and if you've never been a big Bible reader, you don't have to start reading the Bible now. Yeah. You know, maybe it's meditation for you. Maybe it's you know, maybe it's prayer. Maybe it's just more conversations with believers about my spirit feels numb. Yeah. I mean that 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 was me. My spirit felt numb. Like the inner part of me had died a little, you know, whatever that is for you. And I just want to encourage you to do it. You're not going to feel like it. Um, But when you can start pursuing God or faith on your own, it's when you realize that your entire relationship with God wasn't tied up with that church or that leader or that person who hurt you. Um, And I think that takes away, again, talking about taking away control from the narcissist. Yeah. That takes away a lot of control from them and gives you control back when you realize I can have a relationship with God that is separated from those people who hurt me or people who could hurt me. That's not an excuse to not ever go back to the church, of course, right. um, yeah. but that's what's helped me get back into church mm-hmm. because it's it's been a reminder as I've leaned into God on my own, okay, God, I haven't stopped believing in you. Right. I have stopped believing in some systems. I haven't mm-hmm. stopped believing in you. I haven't stopped believing in churches. I have stopped believing in some systems of thinking, certain mm-hmm. types of leaders, maybe even certain denominations. But I haven't stopped believing in God or right. faith. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So um, any other parting words just for our listeners today? Uh, I want to tell any lead, lead, any listener. Yeah, so you got it too. <laughs> here, it's late. Ooh, it's late. Yeah, any listener who this this message is really resonated with. Um, we want to be here so we can help you start to heal. Mm. And maybe this episode, you know, has really gotten you upset. 
maybe there's some tears that have flown. Like I've, I've felt some tears as we've been recording today, but maybe this is where you need to be. Maybe God is using this as an opportunity for you to feel that connection that you know, that you are still loved by him, that you are still one of his own. And although you've been hurt, that's not where you should stay. So we want to be that for you. We want to give you the opportunity to say, <sighs> and if all you've got is some breaths, breathe heavy. Mm, yeah. Breathe heavy. And maybe next, next week you'll feel like there's a word there. And it may just be one word, but we want to be able to make this a safe place for you to walk into that to start feeling that healing yeah. to start seeing some of those wounds and uncovering them so you can start to let them heal. Yeah. Well, and, and we're not just, you know, we keep talking about this community and, and that's not because we, you know, we want money or anything else. Um, guys, we believe in it. Um, not just Sean and Corey, but all of our hosting community that you're going to meet there in the community, interacting with our community members every single day for no reason other than we love you and we understand the pain you're going through. We can't put ourselves in your shoes. We don't know what you're going through, but we understand the pain and we believe at the same time, very kind of churchy sounding thing, but I believe it completely out, even outside of church. I believe your best days are ahead of you. You don't yeah. have to stay in this place that you are. And uh, we would love to help you heal, but Hey, there's a lot of fun podcast episodes. We, we've, we've right. Easter egg yeah. dropped a lot of stuff tonight. Um, tons of stuff coming, tons of content coming. Um, we'll give you, we'll keep talking more about release schedules and all that, but you don't want to miss some of these episodes as we're going in deeper. Thanks for hanging out yeah. with us tonight. As we talked about why church disrupted, who we are, why we're doing this thing that we're doing. Um, but Hey, we would love to see you in the community, but if you're not there yet, that's okay. Just continue to be a part uh, of listening, watching the podcast, interact with us online. We would love to connect with you. We just want to get to know you. We want to support you in any way that we can. Um, but Hey, one thing you could really do again, we know we're going to have the trolls coming out of the woodworks. Yeah. If this has helped you, if you could just review it, subscribe, share wherever you're listening, just subscribe so that you know when this is coming, give it a review. We don't want to ask you for a ton of stuff. You can do it once and you can be done. And when I say share, I'm not even asking you to share on social media. If you feel like, you know, you need to do that, do that. That's awesome. We would love it. Um, but sometimes the best way you can simply share is to say, Hey, I know someone else who is hurting, or I know someone else who this would hurt or this would help. Um, and just send them a text message. Hey, here's a podcast I just listened to, right? Um, we don't care about follows and we don't care about likes and we don't care about money. Um, what we care about is we care about getting this content in the hands and hearts of the people who need it most. Cause Hey, we're yeah. taking on spiritual abuse. We're taking on church hurt one conversation at a time. So, Hey guys, we love you all. Thanks for staying with us through the first episode of church disrupted. We can't wait to see you next episode over the next few episodes. You're going to meet a bunch more of our community hosts, people from a lot of different backgrounds and perspectives. Uh, here's spoiler alert. Not all of us have come from evangelicalism, right? right. Um, we, and we have people from all kinds of different cultural backgrounds as well. So, uh, I can't wait for you to meet the rest of the hosting community and we can't wait to keep walking this church disrupted journey with you. We'll see you on the next episode. Yeah.